Good afternoon and welcome to the second day of the eighth annual national conference on economic, social, and cultural rights 2021. With our theme, reclaiming public services for inclusive and sustainable social economic recovery from COVID-19. I welcome you today for those of you who are in this auditorium at the Kampala Conference Center at the Serena Hotel, but also welcome all of you, our viewers across Uganda, and those who are joining us on social media. You're most welcome. We're going to have a, an engagement here. Where we'll be talking about the role of citizen participation in ensuring quality of public services. We have men and women of substance with their different expertise who will be adding value to the discussion that we have today. You can also participate in the auditorium by telling us what you have to, question you want to ask, or maybe sending your message so that it can be read and you'll be part of the discussion that is going on here. What is the role of a citizen while participating in ensuring this quality of public services. As a citizen of Uganda, you have a duty because one of the duties that you have to vote. When you vote, you give our leaders the mandate so that they can be able to lead. But also, they are there to serve you. So money is generated through the taxes that you pay, parliament is appropriating the money, and you have to ensure that, that there is effective utilization of the money that is meant to work for you. So those are the things we'll be looking into as now I call the panelists to take their seats. Let me invite the Honorable Rashida Nambora, District Chairperson Butambala. Please let us welcome Rashida with a round of applause. We could do much better than that, can't we? From Butambala, the Honorable Rashida Nambora, District Chairperson Butambala, thank you so much for joining us. And ladies and gentlemen, let us again welcome, with a round of applause, Commissioner Education Equal Opportunities Commission, Mr. Kamia Julius. Mr. Kamia Julius, you most welcome, please, a round of applause for Mr. Kamia Julius. Okay, Kamia is uh, differently abled. Somebody is going to help him to walk him to the, to the podium where he'll be able to speak from. And uh, as the Kamiya is uh, being brought help to come to the, to the podium, let me invite uh, a community representative from Greater Masaka, is actually network coordinator for Community Transformation Foundation Network, Kotfon, Mr. Kayingi Mudu Yisto. Okay, so I'm going to begin with the Commissioner Education Equal Opportunities Commission, Mr. Kamia Julius, telling us the role of citizen participation in ensuring quality of public services. Panting, come on. I'm still panting. I'm, not, I'm still panting. I'm not set off. Just a minute. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kamia, you, you don't want to go right now? No. Okay, Let, I'll go through the district, the district chairperson <coughs> from Butambala, uh, since Rashida was even first on the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, Rashida, please, if you could go first. Rashida, number one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, moderator. My name is again, I'm Rashida Nambua, District Chairperson Mutambala. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Makerere School of Law, who have done a very great job to, job to organize this eighth annual national conference on economic, social, and cultural rights. First and foremost, let me briefly give you a definition of the word public service. It is the service intended to serve all members of the community irrespective of gender, tribe, and religion. Public service delivery, this is a mechanism through which the public services are delivered to the public by the local or municipal or federal government. Citizens' participation. It is a way through which citizens exercise influence and control over the decisions that are affecting them. In this category, we have three main actors. One are the citizens, 
two are the politicians, and three, we have political public officials. Now, the role of citizens' participation in ensuring public service delivery can easily be summarized in three or four ways. One is the working relationship. Two is the accountability for the smooth running of, of the, the society. Three, since, it, since we, base, we base on their needs to lead the, the, to leads the needs, it leads to efficient accountability and efficient allocation of resources. Deep there in the village, we always have a saying that Awakusiwa Otakula. Since the citizens are, are involved in the decision making, they are always they are always based on their we always based on their needs to to come up with the decisions that we always we 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 stand on to allocate resources. Thirdly, fourthly, it eliminates literate environment, illiterate environment. That's what I can give on the role of citizens' participation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashida, district chairperson from Butambala. And you know, as a district chairperson, it's a big administrative unit, so you are dealing with the people every day. So you actually know what the people want and what their role is in ensuring there's public service delivery that is of quality. And uh, so that's the chairperson there. Maybe now, Mr. Kamia, you could be able to speak, Commissioner Education, Equal Opportunities Commission. Hello. Yes. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Julius Kamia. I work with the Equal Opportunities Commission, and uh, I, I head the education and communications work at the commission. Glad to be with you this afternoon. Um, just one little reminder, I know you have uh, heard and read a lot about the commission, but it is uh, a government entity established under Article 32 of the Constitution of this Republic and operationalized by the Equal Opportunities Commission Act of 2007, mainly to redress imbalances in society and to ensure that uh, nobody is left behind in Uganda's development process. Perhaps what I have just said last ties in well with the uh, subject of our discussion. Uh, I mean, not go into the definitions which my colleague from Butambala has done ably. Um, but just to state that uh, when I was thinking through this particular topic, my concern was around two actors. One, the duty bearer, and two, the rights holder. And you want uh, to hear my views around the role of the rights holder in ensuring a delivery of quality services in this country. Um, and the rights holders are in various categories. They are diverse. To begin with, me and all of you in this room are rights holders. But possibly we want to focus our attention on the majority of Ugandans who cannot make it into this conference hall. Among them, you have those who are marginalized, who are disadvantaged in comparison with the others. Well, we wonder what am I talking about. Among the citizens that we are concerned about, you are thinking about um, women to start with, possibly uh, disadvantaged women. They may be single mothers or poor single mothers. 
they could be uh, women who are heading households, but with no financial muscle. They could have financial muscle. They could be men unemployed. They could be men from ethnic minorities. They could be persons with disabilities. Uh, the moderator said differently able. <laughs> That's a long twist. <laughs> but you are a person with a disability. They could be unemployed youth. Uh, that's not to say that the employed youth is not a citizen. I'm specifically talking to those categories because of the mandate that uh, I hold at the Equal Opportunities Commission. They could be people in hard to reach, hard to stay areas of this country. Areas where services seldom reach. Um, you might think of certain parts of our islands in, in, in Kalangala, in Bovuma, certain parts in Karamoja, certain parts in Sebei. If you have to go to certain districts, or, or one of the districts in Sebei, you must first go to, to Kenya before you get there. So what's the role of all these people in ensuring quality uh, social services. We see that role in, in, in a, a number of ways, one of them being providing information to, to who now? They would be duty bearer. They may be policy makers, they may be policy implementers. And we are talking about people who are at that influential level whether they are government or non-government actors. What is, uh, how do we value the opinions, the uh, attitudes, the views of these people who are usually not reached, either consciously or unconsciously? Their views are critical in determining the destiny of our country. So they need to be consulted in our planning processes, in the processes of developing um, and implementing our programs, whether in the education sector, whether it is operational wealth creation, is it in the health services? Are we, are we, are we, we are now talking about the parish development model, which is a new strategy for us to see how services can reach down to the grassroots. How much are we doing to consult these people? For us at the Equal Opportunities Commission, we are concerned with the three major concepts for the citizen to be part and parcel of these processes. One, to ensure that there is access to opportunities and services. And access means also that you have, you are given space to participate on the decision-making table. Uh, we want uh, possibly to say a thank you to the status quo, the political status quo, because it has provided space for political participation of the majority of these categories that I talked about. So at the district level, for instance, and the lower local government, like um, the, the, the sub-county or the divisions, you will have the councillors who are representing the youth or young people for that matter. You have uh, women councillors, you have councillors for persons with disabilities, recently older persons. And, and, and we, we, we assume that their views are going, are going to be heard. They are going to take their views to the decision-making table. Services reach the ordinary Ugandan um, using these administrative structures, the district, the sub-county. When, when I say that, I also am catering for the urban areas. But you know that when we're doing our planning before any interventions, we, we, we conduct a lot of research and these are the people who are providing information. So the talk about bottom-up planning, bottom-up planning, 
hinges strongly on the participation of the citizen of this country. Um, uh, the moderator might want to ask later <laughs> whether their views get to those highest levels. But uh, I, I want to contend that when you consult from the village level, get to those committees now talked to at the parish level, sub-count and so on, the views are co being collected, collated, sieved through the process. And the, and the citizen is playing a part. Uh, the other aspect is around the question of accountability. How is this citizen able to question the powers that be? We gave you mandate to deliver on this and that. To what extent are you delivering? Now that calls on all of us to build, um, to, to build the capacity of the citizen to be able to question. And uh, that is not a job for a day, for a year. The capacity in many, way, many ways is still lacking, and specifically for the categories that I have pointed out. They are still uh, limited in capacity. Certain categories are still lacking in confidence levels. Uh, they may not be able to face the member of parliament of their area to question this, or the chief administrative officer of the district to say, why, why, is, why is that we do not have a good school in sub-county X? Our roads are impassable. We do not have, uh, we are not able to take our agricultural produce to the markets where we would get money. So th those kind of questions, uh, the capacity to bring them up may still be lacking. Our citizens are still looking at the politician at the level of uh, vying for votes to see what they have to give them as handouts so that they can decide on who to vote for and who to leave out. And we need to get that out of the citizen. Um, for now, uh, Mr. Moderator and the members, allow me to just hold it there. And you possibly might tickle me further to mention a few other things. Thank All right. you very much. A round of applause to Commissioner Julius Kamia <laughs> from the Eco Opportunities Commission. I think now we'll go to Kayinga Mudu Yisto, community representative from Greater Masaka. How, what is the role of citizens' participation in ensuring quality of public services? Thank you very much, the moderator. Thank you very much, fellow panelists, for breaking down the, the, the topic that we are discussing right now. I'm called Kayinga Mudisto, the network coordinator, Community Transformation Foundation Network. This is the network of grassroots community organizations and the groups working together to address the needs of the vulnerable and the marginalized groups for healthy and safe communities in the Greater Masaka sub region. Our secretariat is based in Chuangala, Luengo district. I'm very happy to be representing Greater Masaka on this podium. And uh, court phone is about empowerment. Court phone is about amplifying the voices of the vulnerable and marginalized groups. Court phone is about accountability. And above all, court phone is about action. But all that cannot be possible without respect for human rights and the dignity. Back to the topic that we are discussing right now, the role of citizen participation for service delivery. Uh, in our perspective, as a grassroots network that has been monitoring service delivery for the past five, 15 years, 
We see citizens, literally, as the public. So they give, they give you quality data. And the citizen gives you the real-time state of the public good. That is our observation. Two, quite a number of the rural community, like where I come from, Kianukuzichuanga and Irengo district, such communities, if not all across the country, are not sensitized. Secondly, they are not actively engaged due to the fact that mo the most information is not in languages consumed locally there. My third submission on this topic uh, looks at suffocation of critical citizens on public service or public services should stop. Most times, where a court phone works through a network of community monitors who are based in rural communities in their villages monitoring the delivery of public services, you go, they, you go ahead to be blinded anti-government. Yet when a road is not done well, we are able to reach out to our local leaders and they get redress. So when you look at all this, when we talk about health, now we're talking about COVID. In our exercises we have been doing to monitor the vaccination at health facilities, you will find a lot of things, but when we address them to local leaders, to our, to our policy makers, they get solutions to them. So suffocation of critical citizens like Kainga and the rest, what if not stopped, it means our right that is God given was curtailed. And it is in our right to demand for the quality services from the state. I beg you to submit. Thank you so much, moderator. Thank you so much. A round of applause to <laughs> Kayinga Mudu Yisto. I think they have challenged all of us, including Ugandans who are not in this auditorium, because we are the people who give the mandate to our leaders to be in positions of leadership. We are the people who are paying our taxes. We are the people for the state is working for us. But it appears even if we asked in this auditorium how many of us have been able to go and ask our leaders to demand for accountability of what they have done. If it is not true in this auditorium, how do you expect people in rural Uganda to be able to go to their leaders and ask for accountability? Yes, tax, taxes are generated. Uganda Revenue Authority collects. Yes, the parliament is going to appropriate funds to different sectors. But is there you, effective utilization of the money that has been collected for you, for your behalf, for our country? So how do we build that capacity that Mr. Kamia was talking about at the very beginning? So that we will have people who are bold, who are effective, who are assertive, and can ask for what is theirs. Also understanding that they also have a role and a right and a responsibility given to them by the Constitution of Uganda. Because it's not enough for you to go and ask for services to be delivered to you, yet you also have obligations that you're not undertaking. So at this moment, I'm going to be asking for uh, any supplements you have from the audience. You'll put up your hand and tell us where you're from. And, and, and give us um, what we need to do so that we build uh, civic competence. There is civic engagement. People who are going to stand up and ask for what is right, with respect. You know, sometimes people can demand, but I've seen where people even want to abuse. You don't have to abuse. You just have to speak the facts with respect to those who are supposed to serve you, because that's your right. Yes, sir. Somebody's going to bring a microphone to you, and uh, you keep it. Please, let's have a microphone uh, going through. So it is, it is very important for people to exchange ideas. Um, how, many, how, how many people know how much money has been brought to a certain administrative unit like a sub-county? For what activity? If you don't know how much money has been brought there for what activity, how are you going to demand 
for effective utilization of public resources when you do not know the money that has been brought to that sub-county. But if you really give a mandate to somebody because he bought your vote, do you even have a right to ask for better service delivery? After all, you sold your right on the ballot. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. My name is Pascal Yamuriat. I come from Teso sub-region. Before we even begin talking about proposals, I've been thinking through what is the problem. In Teso, every time there's a problem, people say, Okwea Pugan, Okwea Pugan. I have listened to it in Buganda. They said to Saba government at Yambe. So every time there is a problem, people are referring, they're running towards government. My question, which we need to begin to rethink, is, is it a cultural problem? That every time we are challenged, we, we, we seemingly withdraw from, from the role. Is there a problem with the communities? Why are they withdrawing from participating? Or are there specific issues that we need to address which, which will enable our people to participate in governance issues? And, and for me, this is a bit of a contrast. I'm looking at it in our context. It's a bit of a contrast when you look at the international community. Uh, specifically, if I, I look at the American citizens, drawing from what J.F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. In Uganda, given our local context, just for us to understand, is citizen participation a myth? Because I, I've begun to think that we have withdrawn over time. Could it be that people's voices have been stamped a lot for a very long time, that every time you try to raise an issue that Kamiya talks about, you can't amplify your voice because someone is stepping on you, not allowing you to be able to raise your voice. And then lastly, I ask, if citizens fail to, to participate, who bears this burden? Who has this responsibility? And I conclude by saying, I think for me this is a mindset issue. People need to understand that they have a responsibility. And what we are doing here is to support that process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, brother from Teso. Maybe I should add that uh, you know, there are agencies of government whose mandate it is to uh, cut out civic education so that Ugandans can know their rights. And I think that is Uganda Human Rights Commission, and I'm sure it is represented in this, in, 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 in this auditorium, so that Ugandans can, be, uh, civic, you know, can have civic competence. If they don't have that civic competence, you as an agency of government, as Uganda Human Rights Commission, maybe you have not done your job as required of you. We have the supreme law of the land, which is the constitution. That constitution also says it should be translated in the local languages. How are Ugandans going to know the law if the law is not written in the language they understand? And yet that is the supreme law. I don't know whether Commissioner Medi wants to talk something. Okay. <laughs> There's a hand up behind there. Thank you, my name is Mwebe Kalibala. I work for IAP. Um, this goes to the chairperson of C5. There's a very worrying trend recently where we're seeing politicians do everything from uh, giving hospital beds to food. And lately, I saw an MP giving culverts. And it was, it's worrying because we don't know whether now we still have a government that is meant to provide for the people or that the politicians have taken the center stage and, and that you should account for giving us everything from, from, because we pay taxes and we hope the government should be providing services. But now the politicians have taken center stage. So where do we start a discussion of us as citizens demanding? That, that's that's in, in the latest stress that's really bothering. Thank you. Okay, um, Rashida is gonna have the time to respond to that. And by the way, Rashida, feel free, because you are a people's rep leader in Masaka. And, 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 these, and we need to build the capacity of the local people in Butambala, in Luengo, and wherever. And, and I'm sure they are even watching right now. It's OK if you can even speak to them in a language they understand best, so that they, because they are the people we are looking at to build their capacity. OK, Rashida, if you want to respond to. Thank you so much for the question. These days, politicians always participate in giving out each and everything that they think it can work or bring them support. 
for example, delivering hospital beds to the, hospi to, to the patients or to hospitals, simply because they, they signed an agreement that was not formal to the citizens that they are going to work to them in each and every angle. Trust me, citizens' need can't be, can't be fulfilled, but we tried our level, our level best to fulfill those needs. If you bring, let's say, beans, they can ask, we don't have hoys, we don't have maize. So their needs are non- that are impossible. We can't fulfill them. Thank you. All right. A round of applause for Rashida. Rashida has, uh, has a, a, you know, a background because as a district chairperson, the, the things she's talking about are the things she has seen. These people have given her the mandate to lead them at the district level. So every day she sees those who have the capacity to ask and maybe those who do not have. But also as a politician, she can see people, how they get the mandate. Sometimes you bribe yourself through, or you give those, the, react the needs of the people to those that you can. Uh, yes, let me get as many views as possible. And, uh, and like I said, if there is an issue and you think it should be understood in a local language, if it is Luganda, express yourself in Luganda. Because sometimes we come in auditoriums like these and we talk a lot of English and make a lot of sense, but we are making sense to ourselves, yet we need those people to know. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, moderator. Um, maybe, you know, I can speak English, but I, I, I still put this question towards um, Honorable Rashida, Tengenda Choge, Ram Luganda. Mm -hmm so that we clearly understand where the issue is. Um, Tetsola kogera ku citizen participation nga tetuogede ku local government because abantu ba wansi te watu kilira central government, watu kilira local government. That's why we have this whole entire process of decentralization. Kati in Butambala, yegwe LC5. And njako uh, ongera ku Omwami Mwebecha Yogede Ngagambanti. We see MPs now. They are the ones who are doing these public things that are supposed to be done by government. But uh, we have these committees uh, on ground. And I, I don't know if people on the ground even know about these committees. We have the water uh, user committees, we have the health management committees, the education management committees. How effective have these committees been? Where they can actually reach out instead of running to the MP, but rather run to the local councillors about these committees. Are they effective? Thank you. All right, Rashida. Thank you so much for the question. At the district level, we always have departments and the heads of departments that he, whenever someone comes to the, with a problem, we refer you to that very person who can handle that problem. But it shocks us when we, we come up with some people who always complain to the councillors and members of parliament that fees maybe I don't have school fees for my for my child. Uh, I, 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 imagine someone to impregnate a woman for nine months and then ask for the bills. All those things people look at politicians and members of parliament as their savior. Simply because at the district level we have a very small budget that we use from, that we use in different departments. Let's say, like at Butambala, we have 26 billions that we use a year. If you distribute this money, most of that money goes to the salaries. 
and you remain with a little that we can use for other services. That's why maybe people run to politicians looking for, for help. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, uh, maybe let's come back to Mr. Kamia here, because earlier you talked about capacity building. And uh, w where did we lose it? To start looking at individuals and thinking individuals are the ones who are supposed to do things that is for public. I mean, is it at the election time? How do we get to know the role, for example, of a member of parliament, which is not really to, to, to do all those things. Their job is to appropriate funds, their job is to legislate, and their job is oversight role. Mm. But the people do not know. And the members of parliament also continue to do what is not expected of them and what, what is outside their role. How do we build that capacity of Ugandans who are bold, who are assertive, yeah. and know their rights? Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, what the Englishman said too much of anything is dangerous. My undergraduate background is in, in communications. Um, you know, today we have a proliferation of uh, media channels, whether they are television, whether they are radio, they are newspapers, they are social media, various platforms. And uh, each of them is communicating something to the people. But the extent to which you are able to say that I have these people picking this information, uh, that's difficult to tell. Others have chosen those journals that are playing music. People have been disempowered in terms of accessing vital information. Uh, they, 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 they will go and take a lot of time on watching certain, uh, whether they are, f do you, they call them films or, or whatever they are. And, and they do not have this vital information that can move them from step A to, to, to step B. So you don't know when to tune to which channel. That was not the case a couple of years ago. One, there was a time when I was much younger. I, I was able to tell on this radio station from morning there is this program, there is the other, until I got to sleep. I, I knew what, what the programs would be. Now, that's not to say to have one media is the best thing. But we need, how, how do we regulate, how do we regulate media so that at least sometimes there is vital information for the citizens to use to be able to be productive so that people are not just listening to music with their earpieces okay, on their telephones. <laughs> That's one area where I think personally we have had people disempowered. The, um, but also information has not been accessed, like my colleague from Luengo said, some vital information is not accessed in languages that people speak. They are local languages. Can we take it upon ourselves as duty bearers that for all vital information, we do not just leave it in English. We turn it down to the local dialects. Um, the other area, moderator, where I think we, 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 we went kind of wrong, I am not an economist by any standards, not at all. But I think the ordinary citizen has been economically disempowered in this country. How that has happened uh, may be a debate for some other day. But because of their vulnerability now, as a result of the economic disempowerment, that's why they go to their knees for the, when the politician is before them. And they want all these handouts. Can I have some money to pay fees for my child? And they are engaged in that. People have resorted to handouts. People are expecting free things as opposed to working to get uh, their survival. 
majority of people are in that situation, and that, that's dangerous for our country. I, I think because of those, those are some of the areas we, we need to address. People need to get economically empowered. When, 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 uh, <laughs> when Prime Minister and her team are responding to the vulnerability groups that newly emerged as a result of the COVID lockdown, now 100,000 per person kind of disappeared in many ways. They didn't go to the right person. I think that's the other problem we have. We, we, as, we, as Ugandans, we have increasingly become selfish. Even when I have the capacity to fend for myself, even when the lockdown has not affected me, I think this 100,000 should come to me and the other people I have to register because I have the opportunity to register uh, my children, cousins, and, 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 and wife and other wives. Mm? That's, that has become a problem to us as Ugandans. I think uh, Christianity or Islam or Buddhism has gone so low in us uh, we, we have we have become very difficult to our and our neighbor and those we need to address the so part of the solution should have to do with the spiritual uh, we have to re address the spiritual aspect of the ugandans thank you very thank much. you julius uh, julius has given us a lot of uh, <laughs> it has taken us to many areas but mm. one thing i don't maybe believe that it's not that because we have s proliferation of so many radios and TVs, and for that matter, I thought those should be em helping in empowering Ugandans. But what do you think uh, we should be able to do so that everyday citizen mm. can have the capacity to ensure there's quality public service? Uh, there's a gentleman in front here. Thank you very much, moderator. I'm called Joshua Chisauzi. I do community outreach with the Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. Uh, Mr. Kamiya stressed the need to build the capacity for the citizen to question on better service delivery. I would like to inform you that as an organization, as we've been championing in this, we have a big number on the ground of people, we call them community advocates, who are championing building the capacity of the local community to demand. And if I'm to give you an example, like just last week, residents of a village called Bugoma, down there in the Kayunga district, they refused the commissioning of a substandard classroom block, which is worth 84 million. They said no. It has cracks, but hasn't started working. They said no. And in places like Namayingo, down there, there is a rural district, as you go towards Kenya. People, local communities have been writing to the local leaders at the sub county level, demanding what they are lacking within their communities. For example, a school called Namihinya. Some of you might be knowing that area. They wrote to the sub county demanding for safer water, water source, and it was constructed based on the demands of the local community. So my suggestion is if the local leaders like Madame Namboa and other stakeholders at the grassroots level and CSOs come out to build the capacity of the local community, they can demand. But demanding from the government, it seems it is going on failing. Otherwise, if the local community come out as ISA is doing, building their capacity, it will be very, very, very well. Thank you very much. I think Mr. Kisaus is, is telling us, he's giving us hope that there are some areas of Uganda, there are people who can see things not, not going right and they're able to stand up and say no. And he has an example of a primary school block, of a classroom block that was, uh, that they were, did not allow for it to be commissioned because they thought it was substandard work. How do you make such kind of spirit infectious in the rest of Uganda? We have, Come in front here, two ladies. Thank you very much, Mr. Modorita. Mine is not a question, but through the panelists, you raised the issue of civic education, and you mentioned the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Uh, my name is Atwem Theopista. I work with the Uganda Human Rights Commission. 
and uh, I wanted to bring it to the attention of all the people we have here and the viewers outside that Uganda Human Rights Commission, as an institution mandated to promote and protect people's rights, we've been there, we've been outside there to sensitize the public, to sensitize citizens about their rights and responsibilities. And actually, that's why when you move out, people know most of their rights. But as a commission, what we are still struggling with are responsibilities, because Rights go hand in hand with duties and responsibilities. Actually, I think that's why even in this hall, we are talking about some of the rights we are supposed to be having. We are talking about some of the services we are supposed to reclaim as citizens of Uganda. But as the Uganda Human Rights Commission, we've been there. And in order to bring services closer to people as an institution, we have regional offices everywhere, 10 regional offices. We have field offices. We appear on different platforms to sensitize people about their rights. We appear on radios, we appear on TVs, actually for your own information right now, we are sensitizing people about uh, democracy and we have a member of the commission, Commissioner Murumba, right now on NBS and, she, and he will be joining us shortly on this program. But I wanted to tell our viewers that in case you feel your rights are not well protected, please approach the Uganda Human Rights Commission in all our regional offices, in all our field offices, and at our head office in Kampara. We shall continue sensitizing people about their rights. I thank you. Know, you. Your work should have been made easier if they hadn't removed a subject called maybe civics, a political education, because that would supplement on what you're doing. But now you have a regional office and a few officers scattered here and there. You mean good, your intentions are good, but you are thin on the ground. How about if it was just uh, you know, left for the schools also as well to continue with the civics like we did and political education? I thank you. They can join us. We join hands and we do the same. Nobody can stop all of us here. Okay, uh, yes, there are still some two people on the table there who would want to contribute. Uh, thank you, moderator. My name is the in Jogero, Uganda. No, the twice we knew Muruzungu, I want to have a two rabbins, so I will be together, coach of a bit together. Kogamba shall together coach it in Tiruachi to Ron, Daba Kulembez and Nevata to Koleda. Unze Kusinzira Kuchendaba and Songa Zamirundi Minji. It's soca to the window of the Gambant. No man our feca to Muena again, Dari Eko. So, kwa gamba, ni tumu gamba, ni tumu na yetu genda kusi indi kwa gendo liye, kwa na fetu wetu weli ili. So, katese geza nti, kwa malo kutuka mchifecho, kwa gamba, na yaba ino kwe lisa. Haba, ye kwa lela ye ngo muntu, chovo walabe yoko local government, chovo mma district, mubalaba, butenda wona, awediza, okusoro zempoza, mkatale, awediza, okusoro zempoza, bulikunteje basara, awediza, kwa gamba, na ye mwana wafena ya kwa lechi, Aliye konenga ate enkole ntufe li ntubotulo ndaba kule mbeze. Okuvira dala kwelo siye ya wansi. Okutukira dala ku parliament. Okutukira dala ku president. Yaba ntu wabu bakozi wa fe. Ate sifu wabu bakozi wabu. Fugamba baba ba ino kutula gabi chibi ya bakola. Tupatu ino kubabu za nti owa, owaye kubo nga lifude. Owaye nga tetulina luzi. Owaye na ikondo nga ya fa. Owaye nga tetulina bikoze sewa mudua lido. So tuweta ago kufamu echi e, 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 nkole yu. Uh, Eda chendi kuogera kufana habari yevu sogana echi dara necho. Nti tuidatu walo ndaba ntu. Haye nga tuloza nti kwe gamba tulonzo mwana waifajari yeku. Haye nga te tuwatu mulo nzaja tukolele. So tulinobu vuna nizibwa kwe gamba bu tumukoba lwa chitito tukolele betu wakulondo kukola. Tuwati tulikumu tawanya haye tuwati tulikumu koba okusobola okuba nti yako leo lwati tuwa mulonde era singa cha chikola waira aba aloza nti ayida kulinda okulonda okuira kwa tu okulia a a omuntu ngo oyo tumutole mutu tamulonda mwebale nnyo mwebale ino thank you very much um, you see what he just said is the exact situation on the ground and so actually I remember during the election, some people were creating posters saying, also send me and they go and eat, you know? <laughs> I don't know whether you saw those things on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Even though they were not seriously contesting for power, but it is telling us the situation in Uganda and how we think. Mm -hmm. It is time for me to eat. It is very true. So we need to change that. Okay. Yes, we st there's, a, there's a lady at the back, then we shall come back to you, sir.
Thank you very much, moderator. My name is Diana Humuza. I teach at the School of Loma Kera University. But in this capacity, I'll speak as uh, a local leader. I am uh, Secretary of Finance of the local, uh, of the LC1 village in, in Mukono, where I stay. It's a village called Chituba. So I wanted to speak to the issue of decentralization of funds. You find that most of the services that the people would, only people would require should be or are required at the villages. So I wanted to speak to the issue of the funds that uh, Honorable Rashida was talking about. If there could be a way in which some of the funds could reach the local, the village level, the LC1. Because you find, as I've said, I'm, I'm, I'm Secretary of Finance, but I, we have never even held 100,000 from government to run the village. So every time there's a, a problem in the village, people will say finance to cause it tear. And then you have to go back to the same people and fundraise to, to, to sort a very small problem because I don't think the LC has ever received any money, the LC one, yet services are supposed to come to start from there. So I think there is a gap there. Secondly, like since our theme is uh, based on COVID, recovery post-COVID, I realized that even when we, we were in the COVID lockdown, uh, I think there were efforts to decentralize the COVID management to the village levels in this uh, last lockdown. So they formed a village COVID task force and the executive council was supposed to be that task force and, and co-opt members that had competences. So they invited us for meetings, went for meetings, we are planning to manage COVID within the what? The villages because things had gotten out of hand. But still the village, I mean that, that, that the COVID fund, man is meant to fight COVID, could not reach. So you were asking them where are the temperature guns, where are the, wh wh where are the things we are supposed to be using. And now we had to basically now start contributing as a village executive to be able to help the village in the fight against COVID. So policy-wise, if there could be a way in which the budget of the, of the OC5 could be decentralized lower so that at least there's some uh, funding to meet those needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You know, in Ahumuza's introduction, I saw something very different. Here is a legal scholar, a lecturer at the School of Law, McKinley University, taking up a position of Secretary for Finance, LOC1. Mm -hmm. For me, me, I kept thinking about that as you are talking other things. That, that's the Ugandan that we all need to be like, I suppose. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Pascal Yamudat again. For me, the, apart from the issues that Mr. Kamiya talked about, we seem, we, I need to add one more thing, that there are challenges with the literacy levels in Uganda. I'll draw an example to s some of the marginalized communities in Kumi district. You have a whole sub-county, no primary school, no secondary school, and you are sending messages on radio let us assume that they're even in English. Who will understand the message that you are sending? So we, we have uh, communities whose literacy levels are going so low that they cannot even demand the very basic that they're supposed to demand. So for me, as, as one of the way forwards, that it, apart from just saying we are going to do civic education, civic education, the question of education must be answered that how come some communities can't even have a primary school? I come in, in, in Terso, where are different districts. You hardly get a secondary school. You get a, a one secondary school in a whole county. And there are dropouts, so many dropouts that from P7, people don't continue. If you also look at, for example, the 2021, 2020 UPE, 21 first graders, a whole district like Soroti which is a mother district where there's a city, but only 21 in Division One for UPE schools. What happens to the rest? It is a bit challenging. So for me, to be able to address the issue of, of reclaiming public service, but also under the theme of citizen participation. Our citizens can participate, but they are limited in terms of capacity because of education levels. This afternoon I received a call from one of uh, people in the village. We want to write a petition. The hospital which was supposed to be here has been taken elsewhere. And you know, people don't even have the basic capacity to be able to write, to write a document, to write to their local leader, to say we, our hospital was supposed to be here, you've taken it away. So we must address specific thing of education to be able to enable our people to be able to address these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going maybe to take uh, two or three more views before we could 
uh, take a break and they bring in another uh, panel to discuss a different issue that is also of public concern. Um, uh, probably, um, uh, uh, Yisito, I don't know whether you'd want to respond to a few things I've heard from the audience. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, the moderator. Uh, I think uh, I could just dis respond in, in regard to what we do. We talk about empowerment, but empowerment in our way, that's where we sensitize our fellow citizens on their rights. The moment I know my right, it remains my responsibility to also sensitize those around me so that we move at the same page. Secondly, uh, even the leaders, I will have to thank uh, the incoming LC5 chairperson, Ruengo, is now trying to show the citizens what they're supposed to do when it comes to public services, when we are having poor roads to come, to come to and challenge the contractors. And I think this president, he needs to scale down that, to sensitize the citizens that for him coming out to challenge the contractor, empowerment through the local government, through his department of community-based services, would be very key to let all citizens to know that this is in our mandate. And when we demand, for example, now we talk about drugs, the truth is the drugs are not there in the facilities. But when you come talk about it, you are just blinded anti-government. But the reality, I come from Chiwangala. When a patient collected COVID, we went there, we had to get six types of drugs. There was only one type. I thank the doctor. He did his job. But five types of drugs were not there. And because it was our response to rescue such a person, we had to improvise, help him get five types of drugs from Kalisizo. To, so these are, these are facts on the ground. But at the moment, the, the moment we talk about them, we present them, but we shall keep that. Because at the end of the day, if we have more Kayingas who would be realists, the challenge is to go away from being idealists to be realists. Talk of the fact, stick to it, make action. We have made little petitions to even go to other areas. Now we have also joined the oil and the gas. We are seeing things not going the right way. But we cannot keep just looking at them. We expose and then we, we see action is coming slowly, slowly. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, colleagues here. Let us join the hands. I know we can change for better because we are demanding what we are paying for. We are taxpayers in Uganda. I think, I think there's no harm in uh, talking about facts and figures, demanding your right. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's no harm. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes when we do that, maybe the language we use we become disrespectful, we become abusive, which is different from demanding, stating what is rightly yours. And if we do that, I, I don't think there's anybody who's going to start labeling you and this and the other. Just ask what is yours, so long as you have your facts and you have your figures. With respect and you keep it, the people will know what you're talking about and the leaders will follow suit. Uh, number one. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the Minister of Finance at one of the LOC, one chair um, at Mukono Villages. She talked about the funds and the budget for the village level. About the COVID-19 uh, about COVID emergency money that we received at the district, we, it, wa it had its own breakdown, whereby each village was supposed to get 400,000 and three in the quarter, in the whole quarter, that is three months. And 300,000 of that money was supposed to be received to the VAHT team. 100,000 was, that, that 100,000 was for, for the village task force for the whole quarter. So trust me, if we distribute that money to the leaders at the village level, each one will get maybe 5,000 or 10,000. So what? <laughs> so the budget that we always receive at the district, if we, break, we, if we break it down to the village level, we can't, we can't distribute that, that budget to the whole villages that maybe a district has. So 
like the other person who said that we, let's stop this saying of government at Uyambe. Some people have started mobilizing their own funds at the village level to, to do what they are supposed to do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rashida. And very, and very briefly, Julius, uh, you're parting short before we take a break. Mm. Thank you very much, moderator. And I want to thank everybody for the active participa participation. Uh, w um, you talked about the, the capacity building. I think um, what you concluded with when you're talking to the colleague uh, from Ruengo is very pertinent, that uh, how you state what you're supposed to state, even when it is a rights issue, when it is your human right, is very critical. And that's part of the capacity that we need to build. Our friends who are not here, we need to seize from saying Okweapugan <laughs> or government at Uyambe so that we know that uh, we also can make a contribution. How I wish we can empower our communities to engage on their, with their political leaders up to the national level to be able to set priorities right so that when they are doing financial appropriation, they think about those areas which touch the common person most. And then lastly, uh, Mr. Moderator, the issue of access to information is very critical. If you do not have information, you're powerless. Okay. Let's devise means of ensuring that information goes down to the people in the modes and languages that they will appreciate best. I want thank to you thank you so much. Please join me with a round of applause to thank our panelists this afternoon, Mr. Kayinga Mudu Yisto, Community Representative from Greater Massacre, Mr. Kamia Julius, Commissioner Education, Equal Opportunities Commission, and the Honorable Rashida Nambowa, District Chairperson of Butambala. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, we're going to take a break uh, for those who are here and for those who are watching on NTV Uganda on our different platforms on social media. When we come back, we should be looking to the issue of electricity and the internet as essential services post COVID-19. Is Uganda an outlier? Let's discuss this after the break. <laughs> Our second day of the annual national conference on economic, social, and cultural rights 2021. We've just been discussing the role of citizen participation in ensuring quality of public services. But now we just want to change gears and look into something else. Electricity and the internet as essential services post COVID-19 is Uganda an outlier. Maybe I repeat, electricity and the internet as essential services post COVID-19 is Uganda an outlier. Let me invite the panelists to take their, their seats and I'll be giving each one of them about 10 minutes or they're about to make their case. And after that, you in the audience, you'll engage them or add to their discussion or maybe disagree with what they would have told us. May I now invite to the podium the coordinator Uganda Consortium of Corporate Accountability Mr. Joseph Biomohanji. Please let us welcome him with a round of applause. Joseph Biomohanji. May I invite Sub Regional Secretary for English Speaking Africa Public Services International, Dr. Evelyn Akech. Also, welcome with me with a round of applause. Cyber Law from the direct executive director, Cyber Law Initiative, Mr. Daniel Bill Opio. <laughs> and last but not least, we have a panelist who is the head legal Uganda Communications Commission, Mr. Abdul Salam Waiswa. I think this topic um, is uh, very close to you and uh, it should be right in your docket. So I'm going to begin with you, uh, Mr. Weiswa. Electricity and the internet as essential services post COVID-19 is Uganda an outlier. Let us start with you, sir. 
Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are honored as UCC to be invited to participate in this discussion. Indeed, to answer you directly, Uganda is not an outlier. Uganda heavily believes that internet is now a basic need. And indeed, being a, a member of the UN, Uganda recognizes that in 2016, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution, a non-binding resolution that recognizes internet as a basic necessity that every human being should be able to enjoy. And indeed, the government of Uganda has put in place so many interventions deliberately coached to ensure that Ugandans continue to enjoy the internet as a facilitative tool for their social, economic, and political transformation. And this did not just start with COVID. The question is post-COVID, but I want to take us back a little bit. Uganda and the government generally hasn't just recognized the internet as a critical tool. Uh, many of you remember that uh, from about 1995, the government began liberalizing the communication sector. And indeed, many laws were passed, including the Uganda Communications Act of 1997 then, to ensure that UCC is set up as an independent body to regulate provision of communication services, specifically tele uh, uh, telecommunication and data services, where internet falls. And this has evolved over the years, and in 2013, government came up with another law that further reinforced UCC's mandate in regulating the ICT sector. And as a result of that, UCC has been able to effectively regulate the ICT sector. We've been able to attract so many operators in the market. As we speak, we have about 35 internet service providers in the country, and all these are working day and night to ensure that internet services are extended to every corner of Uganda. And in 2018, even before COVID came, the government passed what is called the National Broadband Policy 2018, wherein the government deliberately provided an aspiration that there should be coverage, Uganda should have internet coverage at at least 90%, and internet speeds should be available at all places at a minimum of 5 Mbps. That was an aspiration by the government of Uganda. And UCC as the regulator of the ICT sector went even a step further to reform the licensing framework for the ICT sector and made it easy for more service providers to apply and obtain licenses such that they can continue supporting government in its effort to have internet available to all Ugandans. As we speak now, we have Operators that hold licenses, we call the National Telecommunication Operator Licenses. Uh, operators like MTN, Airtel, Leica Mobile, who have an obligation in their licenses to ensure that at least 90% of Uganda enjoys seamless connectivity. UCC has not just stopped at that. We have also come up with different models that ensure that the pricing, the costing, the quality of internet service across Uganda is reliable, is affordable, but also uh, easily accessible to the Ugandans anywhere in the country. And indeed, as many of you could have seen, the cost of internet has continuously been reducing. If you remember, about 20 to 2012, the cost of one GB of data was about $15. As we speak now, there was a report issued yesterday that shows that the cost, the average cost of one gigabyte in Uganda is about 1.5. And Uganda is the second cheapest country, in this, actually third cheapest in East Africa in terms of data cost. So you find the countries in Africa that are still charging one gigabyte at, for example, $45. Uh, but in Uganda, as we speak now, the average cost of one gigabyte is about 1.5. And even because of the liberal nature of the sector, some operators have been given latitude to even come up with pricing, pricing models that facilitate them to make their consumers to access even cheaper data. As we speak now, operators like Leica Mobile, you can buy 50 GB at 30,000. If you translate that into, Uganda, into, into US dollars, that is about 30 cents which is very cheap and very competitive. Why, why are all these things happening? 
is because the government and the regulator recognizes that internet now is not just a luxury. Internet is a road that every person should ride on to attain their desired objective. That's why you are now seeing education institutions are providing services through education. So internet is facilitating the attainment of Article 2030 on the right to education. Internet is now being used to provide uh, justice. You've seen courts now hearing people from prison. The people you're seeing on TV but appearing from Chitali on TV, they're being connected through internet. That is internet now facilitating attainment of justice. You're seeing internet now becoming a, so a business. There are many people who are now opening up shops and trading, selling goods and services via the internet. And indeed, the government of Uganda in the National Development Plan 3, NDP 3, it clearly recognizes that internet is a basic necessity that every Ugandan should aspire to have, and we should all work towards uh, ensuring that Ugandans can access quality, reliable, and good internet. And therefore, to answer you, Mr. Kamara and all the viewers, indeed, Uganda is not an outlier. We are on the road to ensuring that every Ugandan has reliable, very good internet that can facilitate their social, economic, and political activities in Uganda. Thank you very much. But I hope you know, Mr. Waiswa, that right now there would be people who should be streaming, streaming this live on Facebook, and uh, they would also be exchanging ideas, and they may be selling their, their merchandise on Facebook, but uh, the government of Uganda through you has blocked that. And by the way, there are some people without shame working for government who have continued to use Facebook, making announcements of government activities on Facebook, and yet officially, Facebook in Uganda is not supposed to be on, and it's a government official. Even in an office that has support, was issued an order to close, they still forget. They also go behind the back door, and just like the rest of, <laughs> of us, and do that. How, what is your response to something like that? Okay, Mr. Kamara and all the viewers. I actually checked, if you're lucky, I checked UCC, your, your Facebook page is off, so I was going to, uh, as you are talking. <laughs> it's a public secret that uh, Uganda suspended provision of services through Facebook, and that was for strategic reasons. I think from the highest level, there's been explanation as to why that happened. The main reason was to secure Uganda, because the provider of that service was not amenable to comply with the laws of Uganda. As many of you know, the contest between Facebook and governments is not just happening in Uganda. It's now a topical discussion across the globe. And therefore, we shouldn't look at the issue of suspending Facebook as an indication that there is no commitment by the government of Uganda to facilitate people to enjoy internet. But also, too, Facebook is not internet. Sometimes we assume that uh, when Facebook is off, people are not using internet. Statistics show that there are about 32 million people accessing internet in Uganda. But of those, the people that have Facebook accounts in Uganda are less than 5 million. So that tells you that yes, we are not proud that Facebook is still suspended, and indeed I'm aware that there are many discussions going on at higher levels to ensure that Facebook comply with the requirements in Uganda, in which case I believe they will be allowed to continue to resume operations. So I don't want Ugandans to assume that merely because Facebook is not accessible at the moment, there is no access to the internet in Uganda, or there is a blackout. There are so many other channels through which Ugandans can communicate, they can chat, they can research, and they can achieve all the other basic needs. Do you believe that there are some Ugandans who have a choice? Uh, they have a choice. Yeah, do you believe that those who can choose, there are those who can choose Facebook? <laughs> of course they have a choice, but I, I rest mean, my case. <laughs> can we? <laughs> you know, Patrick, I think I need to explain this maybe just yeah, in one yeah. minute. Yes, as as you, that's a, it's a part of human. No, no. You know? As you make choices as a Ugandan or as a person living in Uganda, and as you enjoy your rights, it's always important for you to appreciate that the constitutional environment and dispensation we operate in as Uganda, there is Article 43, which prescribes that in some situations, the government of Uganda may, for reasons beyond you, restrict the level of enjoyment of one, one of the rights that you have. In this case, 
we believe that government took the decision it took because it had to secure the wider interests of the country, and I think uh, that shouldn't be seen as uh, an exceptional intervention. Thank you so much, Abdul. A round of applause to Abdul. If you want to ask a question, of course, there's going to be a time when you'll have to engage him. Uh, maybe let, let's just take it now, take it to Dr. Evelyn Akech. Uh, probably you can tell us more if Uganda is an outlier or not. After all, you represent English-speaking Africa. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Moderator. As already said, I'm Dr. Evelyn Akech. I'm in charge of uh, East and uh, West Africa, English-speaking countries. I work with Public Services International. We're actually a global federation that brings on board all public sector unions across 154 countries. Now, as public sector unions, we believe that the only way for any government or country to attain sustainable socioeconomic growth is through provision of quality public services. Allow me go back to the question on the floor. First of all, I want to appreciate uh, the representative of UCC. I was looking at some of the statistics and research which was released this year. And according to one of them, it actually showed that uh, the penetration of internet in Uganda only stands at 26.2% as at January 2021. Maybe a son to be corrected if that information was correct. Now this uh, in comparison to its neighbor in Kenya, which currently stands at 85.2%. In addition to this, according to Daily Monitor of uh, 2020, that was on 3rd of uh, February, UCC report of 2020 indicated that the cost of one GB of internet in Uganda was higher that time compared to the counterparts in Kenya, Tanzania, and Rwanda. I'm just wondering at this point, with the introduction of excess duty of 12%, is it much more higher? Or from your submission, it has actually gone lower, because that is a paradox. Allow me go back to the issue that I really appreciate that you've actually acknowledged that uh, we have a vision in terms of access to internet to over 90%. That is a progressive, uh, a progressive vision that makes Uganda not to be an outlier. But in terms of reality, we are still outliers. And we can't run away from that fact. You've given statistics in terms of 32 million people accessing or using internet. On average, our population is about 45 million. If I read the last statistics which was given by Minister of Education, we had about 15 million going uh, students. So I'm wondering if you put 32 plus 50, 15 million, what is our statistics? Allow me now go back to the main issue in terms of electricity. We know that electricity is actually very critical if you're going to be able to enhance and attain the digitalization within the new dispensation of the new norm. Because when we talk about the new norm, we simply talk about you know, accessing and embracing digitalization as a nation. COVID-19 for me is a very good, it's actually a blessing in this case, even though it is actually a curse. It has exposed a number of loopholes in terms of inadequate financing that was actually being allocated towards provision of quality public services, including electricity. Now, currently, if you look at our statistics, it actually shows that we have only 20% of the households in Uganda connected to electricity grid. And out of this 20%, 82% of them are found within the urban centers. And that means 18% are found in rural areas. With the advent of COVID-19 in the first lockdown, the government gave a directive that only about 10% of the people should have been maintained in the offices. For higher institutions of learning, they should embrace issues of uh, digital or virtual learning if they're able to do it. For other government workers and private sector, they should also do remote working. What is the implication of this? With only 20% of the households connected to the grid, how would we actually facilitate digitalization to be able to cope with the stress of COVID-19? That is a question we should ask ourselves. Now, on top of that, global research actually shows that the current highest consumption of power is towards issues of internet access, talk about TV access, among others. But the question in Uganda is, 
How much is the cost of one unit of power in Uganda? If I'm using the postpaid, on average, I'm going to pay about 752 without excess duty, without the normal standard charge of monthly, uh, monthly charge. If I'm using the prepaid, or what we refer to as the car, on average, I'm going to pay about 950 shillings per unit. What is the implication for Uganda? Uganda is actually known to produce more power than it actually consumes. We have an excess capacity of about 600 megawatts. And yet, in terms of connection, we have only 20% of the household. Majority of them are being found in the urban areas. Aren't we outliers? If you are able to produce more than what you can actually connect. In addition, we know that we have only about 49% of the districts in Uganda who are connected to the main grid, despite us having the excess capacity. Aren't we outliers from that context? We also talk about the challenge of privatization. If you mark in 2005, when we privatized Umeme, within two years, the tariff cost had actually risen by 34%. But I'm still asking myself in terms of the paradox of concession and Umeme. In 2012, we did IPO, where Umeme was actually publicly listed. And that means the original concession signatories, like Actis, decided to slowly phase out of that, that contract. By 2016, Actis had actually sold all its shares. That means majority of the Ugandans became the new shareholders of Umeme Limited. The question that I would throw back to the public and the policy makers, is the concession still standing? While the original owner who was a foreigner financed by IFC from UK exited the market. And we now currently have Ugandans running the thing. Should we continue accepting to pay high tariffs if you're really going to be part of the dispensation of digitalization? What is the link between electricity and internet? I come from Namutumba. I always tell people I'm a village girl. But for almost two weeks or three weeks, there's never stable power. Either it comes on and off. However, at the same time, Minister of Education is telling us, can we ensure that our kids either become part of the TV, because you appreciate that program, or find means of learning virtually? How can I learn virtually if there's no electricity? Because without electricity, that means some of the internet connection is not going to be accessed. Let's look at the linkages. And just as my comrade has said from UCC, internet is now a basic right, just like electricity is a basic right. And if they are basic rights, it means they're actually public services which the government ought to actually finance. If you're going to see a difference in terms of post-COVID-19 recovery, then the government needs to reconsider in terms of lowering the tariffs of electricity and also re-nationalizing Umeme. But at the same time, we need to ask ourselves, what are the impediments for a country to increase their connection rate from 20% to, let's say, in a modest figure, about 40%? Why are we having the impediments? Currently, if I wanted a, a prepaid meter from Umeme, I'm supposed to pay 750,000 shillings. I want to repeat that, 750,000 just to get a prepaid meter. If I want the poll service, I'll have to depart with two million shillings. Let's ask ourselves, what is the average income of an average or low earning Ugandan to be able to part with 750,000, yet they need the electricity not only to power their homes, but also access the internet itself, and we are forgetting if Uganda is going to actually recover beyond COVID-19, then we need to build the capacity of our local industry. And most of the local industry are at what we refer to as cottage level, household management. And that means they need more power. But if power is quite expensive, they won't be able to achieve it. I beg to submit. A round of applause. <laughs> and you know, as she was making the presentation about the surplus that we are producing, pregenerating, then I also wondered, if we are generating surplus, why are we having uh, higher tariffs? In other words, we are even paying for the power that we are not using. Isn't that funny? That's the case, that we are paying for the power that we are not using. Okay, so let's move on, and uh, maybe uh, let's go like that so that we continue. 
Uh, okay. Uh, yes, you're next on mine. Thank you so much, Patrick. Good afternoon to our viewers. I'll pick it up from where Dr. Evelyn Akech has left it and speak about electricity as an essential service in building back from the pandemic. Uh, drawing from Professor Barrier's keynote yesterday, he ably spoke about neoliberalism, particularly the Bretton Woods institutions, the International Monetary Fund, and World Bank. Ugandans that are old enough know about the Uganda Electricity Board, or commonly known as UEB. And at that time, UEB was mandated to provide electricity to Ugandans. It was in charge of all the aspects of generation, transmission, and distribution. With government taking advice from the Britain Wood institutions, UEB was unbounded, and we came up with three companies. Firstly, the Uganda Electricity Generation Company, that is mandated with the obligation to generate power. Those of us that are old enough, you've paid visits to the Owen Falls Dam. We have hydro power dams, Kira and Naluvali. So Uganda Electricity Generation Company is a government power state that is mandated to do the generation. But key to note is that it gave out a concession of 20 years for the operation and management and maintenance of electricity generation to Eskimo Uganda Limited, which is a subsidiary of a South African energy company. I'm trying to illustrate to us the entry of private actors, and I'll conclude by showing us that it's because of the private actors that the cost of the tariff is extremely high, that Ugandans cannot afford the electricity that is generated here. The second company is the Uganda Electricity Transmission Company. That is 100% owned by government. It purchases this power generated by UEGCL and the private entity Exmo. Exmo. So we also have the Uganda Electricity Distribution Company Limited, which is supposed to now distribute the power to us. And it's at this point that Wumeme, that Dr. Evelyn was talking about, comes into play. In 2005, there was a power distribution concession agreement signed between the government of Uganda and Umeme Limited. She has ably shared the dynamics that when the IPO was issued, we have new players owning Umeme. There is a certain class of Ugandans that are now shareholders in Umeme Limited. So for all the profit I'm going to illustrate, they take it at the expense of majority of the Ugandans that cannot afford the high cost to log on to the power grid. So upon signing this concession, it's a 25-year concession that started running from 2005, which will expire in 2025. Unfortunately, before you get to the expiry date, which is around the month of February in 2025, Umeme is engaging government to begin negotiations around the renewal of this concession. You can imagine they want to keep us trapped in this concession that made the head of state lament just recently when he was in Nama. However, I depart with him because then he was making lamentations on, on the part of the commercial users, saying, how can electricity be very expensive for my investors? Ugandans that listen to him know that he loves using that phrase, my investors. He was complaining, he was alarmed, but McHugh, in the Solicitor General's office, Ugandans are employed and they signed this concession. That is extremely unfair. It has very unfair terms. And in fact, I stand here today to challenge them if they are very proud about the work they did as civil servants. Let them make that concession public, such that Ugandans see the clauses they subjected the country to. The concession has about five doc sub documents, which I won't really go into because it doesn't help us. But I want to illustrate how that concession results into a high cost of electricity to the end user as a consumer, you and me who are the ordinary Ugandans. Section 25 of the Electricity Act of 1999, which creates the Electricity Regulatory Authority that just like Abdul Salam comes from UCCA, it's the regulator in this sector, uh, gives this regulator the power to approve tariffs subject to reasonable costs incurred in the delivery of electricity from where it's generated through the bulk of transmission, distribution networks, up to us, the final consumers. So I'm going to focus largely my discussion on the domestic users, you and me, who are the ordinary Ugandans, because at least the commercial users have the head of state speaking for them. So let me speak for the ordinary Ugandan. So 
Within the tariff structure, we have what they call the social units. Users of this prepaid system know that at the start of the month when you're buying your car, the first 15 units are slightly cheaper. I don't know if you've experienced that. They quote about 250 Uganda shillings. That's for the first units. And in calling it a social unit, they anticipated that it would be enough for domestic use, powering about three bulbs to enable you to also listen to your radio or watch TV, and it should be able to take you through the month. So after those first units are consumed, the next units you purchase in that given month are about, they cost about 747.5 Uganda shillings. And out of that amount of money that you're paying for each unit, Umeme, which is a public entity, and has been ably informed by Dr. Evelyn Akech, it has a new class of Ugandans that are currently shareholders. According to the concession they signed with the government of Uganda, it's supposed to take 32% of this unit price per consumer. So for every 747.5 shillings you pay for, per unit of Yaka, Umeme takes 32% of this unit for that price, you can imagine. So the 32% being broken down, 20% is their return on investment as a private actor, and the 12% is attributed to the operation and maintenance costs of distributing power to us. So you can imagine every 747.5 shillings you pay for a unit of Yaka, 20% goes to this private actor as their return on investment. And that's the reason as to why we have a very high cost of power in this country. We have the highest tariff in the region just last night, I was watching news, and the Honorable Minister for Energy and Mineral Development, Ruth Nankawira, was in Busoga region, particularly in Luka district, asking the locals why they weren't connected on the grid. She was actually complaining. Can you imagine? Very few people are connected to power. And the locals with their MPs stood up and said, the high tariff cannot enable us to get connected onto the grid. You can imagine, people used to joke then when we were growing up that power is generated in Busoga, but they don't have electricity anyway, so it comes back this side in Kampala. So the concession that civil servants in the Solicitor General's office signed with a private entity led us into this trap, and not even the regulator can do anything about it. The moment you terminate that concession, you must pay for the losses. So we are in a trap to the point that even the head of state can only complain, you can imagine, because a certain Ugandan somewhere signed onto an agreement and bound all of us. And because a private actor is involved in the provision of this service, we end up incurring the cost of a high tariff. Evelyn, Dr. Evelyn Akech has ably hinted on how access to affordable electricity has a bearing on human rights. I don't know if I still have some few seconds to conclude. But I would note that even in the Sustainable Development Goals, if you look at Sustainable Development Goals 7, that looks at affordable and clean energy. It acknowledges that reliable and affordable access to electricity is core at improving the livelihood of people. So if Uganda is going to attain that goal, then we need to have the discussion around affordable access to electricity. A round of applause to him. <laughs> it appears we are not only paying a lot, but we are locked in for a long haul. Yes, we are, until 2025. Yes, you take. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. I would love to, my name is Daniel Bilopio from uh, Ad Security. We pivoted from Cyber Law Initiative and we are currently dealing with cyber security, uh, handling our innovations through automation and machine learning. I just want to find out from Patrick whether this program is broadcasting on Facebook. Of course it is not. We are, we are, we are law-abiding Ugandans who just okay, don't want to go against yeah, the law. Otherwise <laughs> they would come and, <laughs> and block us right now. Anyway, um, Mr. Waiswa has provoked uh, a lot of reactions from me. Uh, firstly, he has highlighted the debate on content moderation that is taking place in the world with different you know, uh, countries and uh, platforms such as Facebook and all. It's not only happening with Facebook. Content moderation is a general discussion happening all over what takes place on the internet because the internet is not necessarily a safe space. For example, for young kids who are going to go and find child pornography online. So we are coming in to moderate the content uh, in regards to some of the things that 
overreach what should be there. But the discussion on content moderation should not be stretched to a place where you stifle access. Well, he rightly placed it that um, Facebook is not the internet, but Facebook is part of the internet. In fact, the biggest face of the internet in this fourth industrial revolution is social media. The biggest companies that are coming up and taking over the world, social media platforms. TikTok, a, a, a child of COVID-19, is a social media platform. So if you look around, the biggest players in the internet scene right now are social media platforms. So having a platform like Facebook blocked for reasons which have not been given, I don't think it is really justifiable. So um, of course, you mentioned something about the third cheapest, Uganda being having the third cheapest you know, internet data bundles within the region. Uh, before the two, 2018 OTT tax, the social media tax, Uganda was um, uh, the second in East Africa. We dropped to third. Currently, we are 17 in Africa, so we are doing very badly in, in that regard. So the, the metrics that we are looking at in the increase of the number of internet users from, from, uh, uh, from 2018 to now has been about 1.4 million users. But this increase only you know, skyrocketed as a result of the lockdown measures that came as a result of COVID-19, that every other form of, of service went online. Church is online, markets are online. So you're forced to be online as a result. And the metrics that we see were as a result of the mode of life that was adopted as a result of the implementation of those COVID-19 guidelines. So you could easily be deceived by the numbers. You know, they say numbers don't lie. But in this case, those numbers could lie to you to assume that actually our internet penetration is increasing. In fact, as of 2018, internet penetration in Uganda was at 31%. Currently, it's at 26%, despite the increase in the number of users by 1.4 million users. So a, a huge discussion has to be held in regard to how we are handling the whole internet space to ensure that our penetration increases. Penetration means we are having more people online, more services are going to get online, and then it will have that ripple down effect on the digital economy advertently. Okay. Um, well, for me, I would love to, to, to bring my, I wanted to respond firstly to him, then dive into my conversation with you. My conversation with you is that uh, COVID-19 has been a blessing for everyone that has been working online. The biggest companies that have accelerated uh, mostly internet-related companies. Zoom, for example, no one knew about Zoom before COVID-19. And it was until COVID-19 that Zoom skyrocketed. I don't know what the, the, the sales manager for Skype was doing, but Skype should have really been a leader in that industry. That's a conversation for another time. So, so many other businesses like that, even in Uganda here, startups that were doing work online, like the online butchery, saw their sales rise from 10 in one single day to 100. You know, bring off f uh, fresh, which supplies milk online, so 150% rise in the demand for their products online. So we, we saw that kind of stuff happening with the digital spaces. But what was enabling it was the use of the internet. So when you introduce policies, like again, we argued that the OTT tax was very unnecessary. There were no metrics that were supporting the tax. It was scrapped after failing terribly in, in the space of three years. 12%, the same conversation. We are telling you you're stifling an economy that was a digital economy, which was sustaining the whole economy during a period of lockdown. Any wise government should be able to look into that and actually work to reduce the rates of internet because you want to attract more people online. The more people we have online, the more we are able to transact online. If we have Facebook going on, it's, it's, it's probable that we are going to have more transactions going on on those online spaces. I don't really want to get so technical for the person that is viewing us on um, NTV currently. And it's very absurd that for the person that doesn't have electric connectivity, this, they're not privy to this kind of conversation. So we're only speaking to people that have electricity at their homes. And if they don't have electricity, probably their phones have enough milliampere to be able to sustain the charge that they received from whichever place that they charge their phones. The milliampere is the capacity that your battery has to retain power and then dispose it as you're using it. The best phone in the Ugandan market has about 7,000 milliampere. So when you're calculating the, the time in which it can take to 
to, to be used thus for phones, which take about 70% of the gadgets that work on the internet in, in, in Uganda. Phones take 71%. So the milliampere is the capacity of the milliampere, the discharge times the, uh, the hour. So if you have about 2,000 milliampere's and, and you discharge a, a, a hundred milliampere per hour, you're going to have about 20 hours of work. But if you're using platforms such as Zoom, which are heavy oriented platforms because they have videos, you want to share your documents, share screens, you're going to be consuming more milliampere's. So if you don't have electricity enough to be able to keep charging that gadget, which in this case in Uganda, mostly phones, most, most of us attend those online meetings and you know those transactions on our phones not so many people can be able to aff afford those posh you know apple products and all most of most ugandans are able to afford that third tire makeshift uh, chinese products so that product is not going to last for long and because it can't last for long you cannot be able to do transaction for long for a company that is innovating using the internet like online butchery you really need people to be online and if you can't have them online it means you won't work in a time when um, the, ca the country has been locked down for maybe 40 days or three months. I think I would love to conclude here and then respond to other thoughts that could come in. Thank you. A round of applause. <laughs> and I'm sure you concluded when they're about to run out of power because of the milliampa you call it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure now it, it, some of them who are streaming it, the, the battery is warning. Yes. Uh, Yes. And you know, electricity is so key. I, I mean, my, you can imagine, all of us are using electricity, but how many of us can afford to use it, for example, to make a meal, to cook? You may find even in the highest places in this town, people are resorting to charcoal wood. But what does that mean to our environment? We are actually, as Ugandans, in a self-destructive mode because the deforestation that is going on so that we can sustain our lives as eat mm -hmm. is not going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. You know? Because whoever is going to have supper tonight or had lunch today, mm -hmm. either that supper was prepared using charcoal or wood. But is that sustainable? Okay. Um, we are supposed to have had another panelist who has just joined us now, but because of time, I'm going to give him a few minutes uh, because he really has to at least talk to us, we hear from, to hear from him on this very topic. And uh, he's a commissioner at the Uganda Human Rights Commission, Honorable Medi Mulumba. You will come and stand here, sir, and uh, maybe five minutes only, so that you make your case, and then we can have um, conversation with the rest of uh, the audience. Yeah, thank you very much, Kamara, and good evening, everybody. While electricity is not looked at as a basic human right, it is an enabler to all other rights. With coronavirus and the incessant lockdowns, we have realized that we had social distancing. We have social distancing. Actually, previously, <coughs> this gathering would attract around, three, three, to around 300 people. I think, let me, let me remove this. <laughs> yeah, before this, this gathering could do call in for around 300 people. But right now, we are here on, on TV. We are doing Zoom meetings. And students are doing Zoom classes. Meaning that, and you know, to do Zoom, you need internet and electricity. Without internet and electricity, we know that so many people are being deprived. Yes, for the last 20 years, a lot of efforts have been done to electrify Uganda. But as per UBOS, in 20, 2018 report, they said only 21% of Ugandans can access electricity. And then, accessing electricity, like uh, one of the presenters was saying, the minister was complaining that why are, why, are the rural, why are the villagers not accessing electricity? The truth of the matter, when they tell the communities, the rural areas, that they are bringing electricity, they are very, very happy. 
But when they commission electricity, they are very, very sad. Because they realize it dawns on them that electricity is just going to pass their houses. That is one of the predicament that we have in Uganda. Right now, like uh, one of the, the presenters was saying, to get a, a new connection, you have to pay up to 700,000 shillings. 700,000 shillings. You know, 700,000 shillings, you are in essence you are in essence investing in women. You know, they, they are coercing you <laughs> to invest in women, which is an absurdity. We've had the Electricity Act. It brought so many, so many issues, so many, so many new innovations. We have Yaka. You know, when Yaka came, they said, stealing electricity, let me use the word stealing, is going to be a myth. So electricity is going, the, the cost of electricity is going to go down. But the, the reality is that the cost didn't go down. Actually, Yaka became worse than the, the previous order. Because now, even with Yaka, uh, the U-Boss is contesting their meters. And uh, so at times, when you look at most of the things, the UN in 2016 agreed that the internet is a human right. If the internet is a human right, it can only be enabled with electricity. Actually, right now, to do anything, you need electricity. You need electricity in health. People are doing surgeries, complicated surgeries, when one of the doctors is in the US, and another one is in Uganda, another one is in India, and that can be done with the internet and, and electricity, meaning that electricity is an enabler meaning that electricity is the only way to go and the internet to enable us to, 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 to realize these other sustainable goals that we want. I actually commend Pilak. Pilak was, uh, went and petitioned the Equal Opportunities Commission, telling them about the education inadequacies with, in some other regions, like, like um, Northern Uganda, Eastern Uganda, where performance is very low. And this is at times because of electricity. And you know, electricity also has the gender aspect. When you go to villages, men don't go to fetch firewood. It's the women. And the men must eat. So if we want also gender equality, we must make sure that we provide electricity. And it must be cheap electricity for everybody. Because we've had so much generations. Generation of electricity, so many hydro 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 plants but the electricity is still low and today as we stand here i think we should call on government to make sure that they do something about electricity it is not just only the investors but all ugandans are crying because of electricity even in kampala like kamara said where we have electricity in urban centers people are cooking using charcoal so what does, that, what does this mean? It means we are doing deforestation. It means we are making an affront on our environment. And when we continue like that, I think we are doomed. Finally, the government should ensure that electricity and the internet are accessed by all, and also ensure that the two are affordable, reliable, sustainable, Government also needs to intervene in high cost of fees for electricity connection so that the fees are scaled down and affordable to the ordinary citizens. The high cost of internet also needs to be urgently looked in. But when we, looked at, when we look at rights, we must also not forget about the duties and responsibilities. Yes, yeah, they asked Kamara whether we are on Facebook. You know, at one time, President Trump was put off Facebook because of uh, irresponsible reporting that he was doing. He was put on Twitter. So we must, we must be responsible when we are doing. Actually, I, I came late because I was coming from, NT, from NBS, and we were talking about democracy. And we were with Justice Yabakama. So I told Justice Yabakama that um, really you need to clarify to us. They say that you were running and Muhoz was beating, slapped you. All that was in, <laughs> all that was on social media. You know, they say Yabakama was arrested at Entebbe. 
attempting to fly, to, to, to run away. He was slapped by Muhoz. He was that, which are false. So when we, when we look at the internet, it must be used for appropriate reasons and not these other reasons. Because now internet is doing in medicine, educa medicine education, e-commerce, home use, and nearly everything, electricity must be there. And the internet, they work hand in hand. And for, for internet, it is a human right as for the United Nations and we are members of the United Nations. I thank you very much. Another round of applause to Commissioner Medi Mulumba. You know, we keep saying that we are generating even surplus electricity. Sometimes that surplus, it may not be true. It's just because we don't have heavy industries. You only need about three or four industries, even that Karuma can be consumed by two or three industries, and that's it. So in the next three or two years, if we have investors who put up industries, what we call surplus will not be there. We shall go back to our, our load shedding. It is very possible, because um, that is happening because we don't have many industries. I just want to hear very few ideas, questions or ideas from the audience. I have already a lady there and a gentleman here. I'm going to take very few because of time. So please, a microphone at the back. Uh, your name and where you're from, and please keep it very short so that we can have many views from the audience. Thank you so much. My name is Mildred Ochokoro from West Nile. I thank the panelists very much for well-researched presentations and discussions. Uh, I want to say that here we are talking of connection to the national grid but as far as West Nile is concerned, we are not yet connected to the national grid. Power or electricity in West Nile is run by a company called Wenreco, West Nile Rural Electrification Company. And there are really very many challenges as far as the electricity in that region is concerned. And you find that the citizens in that region are really traumatized, they are disappointed, and they have even given a nickname to Wenroko, and the nickname is called Nyanyu. Nyanyu in Lubera literal meaning any time it comes, any time it goes. <laughs> and this one really has got a lot of impact. Just a live example, in July during the COVID time, five persons in the COVID treatment unit lost their lives, when power went off, when they were on oxygen, when power went off and the generator attendant was unable to respond so quickly. So it really brought a lot of challenges. And then secondly, uh, we have already hopes as far as the Karuma project is concerned. But I, it, it, is, it is disgusts, oh, it annoys when we are hearing that there are already plans of exporting. Now you can't leave your own children hungry and you're able to give food to the neighbors. So this issue of electricity really should be looked into properly. Otherwise we are watching and want to see whether the grid from Karuma is going to reach us or the other plans of exporting are going to be expedited. Otherwise, it is good for the government to prioritize its citizens. And we are saying here it is a right. But now in other places, like in West Nile, it is luxury for the citizens to have electricity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ochokoro. Electricity there is in Yanyu. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that's true. I mean, I mean, you can imagine we have surplus in the entire region has not yet been connected, and we're talking about surplus. What surplus is that? Okay, yes sir. There's, there's, there's a gentleman in front here. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you to the panel. My name is Ivan Busulwa, and I work with PILAC. Uh, it's not the very first time I'm hearing uh, Council Waiswa addressing issues of the internet and accessibility. And every time he talks, he speaks so well about it and paints a picture of we are okay, we do not, <laughs> you can live stream an entire event without buffering and stuff, but that's not how it is. In fact, today he has uh, pointed to Lika Mobile or Lika Mobile, whatever, about five times. They have the cheapest data around town, you can buy all these beautiful things, but how many of you even know about Lika Mobile? 
I bought a line recently under the impression that I would be able to buy 20 MBs at 10,000 at 10, for a month. But the month expired, I had only used one GB throughout that time, not because I was not active, but because the internet itself was okay. so slow. Number two, uh, affordability of, of data. Right now, one GB on average costs 5,000 shillings. We all know how much 5,000 shillings can do for our people out there. And we know that uh, internet usage has graduated from a luxury. It is now a necessity for most of us, from students, businessmen and women, all over. But one GB, 5,000, it cannot last you two hours if you're using it without seizing. So my question, my problem here is find the government boasts of efforts to okay. uh, make internet afford affordable, but the case is not true. Also, as I wind up, <coughs> as I wind up. Now, this is what I'm going to suggest, because we're not only here in the auditorium, we also have people following us on, on TV and on social media platforms that are allowed in Uganda. So I'm going to ask you to uh, pause there, because we're going to take a break. And I want to thank our panelists, um, Mr. Joseph Yomohanji, Dr. Evelyn Akech, Daniel Bilopio, and Abdul Salam Waiswa, and Honorable Medi Mulumba for their presentation. And uh, when we call another uh, panel to discuss. We shall have a bigger uh, plenary. We can bring back those ideas and those questions we had earlier. So let's take a break for those who are watching on NTV Uganda and across the platforms, and then we'll come back with another panel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, moving on, I want to call the panelists to take their seats. They will be discussing financing for public services, a critical reflection on public debt and domestic resource mobilization. May I invite to the podium the Exec Executive Director, Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group, CSBAG, Mr. Julius Mukunda. <laughs> May I invite Julius, your seat is right here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> May I invite Ms. Alana Kembabazi, Program Manager, Initiative for Social and Economic Rights. <laughs> May I invite to the podium Ms. Maria Alessi, who is a, a human rights and development consultant. <laughs> and last but not least, we have the Acting Director, Economic Affairs, Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Mr. Moses Kagwa. I can imagine Mr. Kagwa and Mr. Mukunda, you work together sometimes <laughs> when you're trying to put together a budget or make, make <laughs> and uh, look through the generation and the appropriation and uh, you, you you do that. So I can either start from the extreme left or extreme. <laughs> okay, maybe let me start with Moses Kagwa because you know this generation of or, or funds or, or, or resource resources. There is appropriation, but also there's utilization. Those three things are very important. I wonder how we are performing in those areas vis-a-vis -vis the topic that you have. Please, if you can carry it from there, then I'll come this side. Um, thank you, Patrick. Uh, good evening, everybody. Yes. Um, one of the things that uh, we should start with is how we are, how how good we are doing before the the pandemic. Because uh, in the year, uh, um, financial year 1819, we had grown 2018, 2019. 
sorry about uh, that. Uh, our growth rate was 6.4 percent, and um, we are on that growth trajectory, uh, trajectory of moving from six to seven over the medium term, and then a COVID-19 struck. And this disrupted a lot of things. It disrupted uh, uh, supply chains, it disrupted uh, transport, it disrupted uh, tourism, entertainment, education, manufacturing, to such an extent that uh, a lot of countries experienced uh, a recession in the world. Um, we are lucky that at the end of 2019-2020, we posted some growth at uh, 3%. But what did the pandemic do? It shook our projections for revenue, and uh, we hadn't been doing uh, very, very well in revenue collection, but it did shake our uh, collections. And for the first time, we registered a shortfall of 2.5 trillion. That was massive. That's about two percentage points of GDP. Uh, for the first time, we had to borrow more because there were abnormal times. We had to borrow money from the World Bank. We had to borrow money from the IMF. We had to borrow money from, uh, um, from banks, both here and outside, to be able to provide uh, the services that were required uh, during COVID. Of course, you know what the lockdown meant, that businesses came to a halt. 50% of the businesses collapsed and uh, all uh, are closed, and then almost 70% uh, employment was affected one way or the other. So we, we had to, uh, to look at what we had as a budget, adjust it for the, uh, for the reduction in revenue, but also provide money to try and save lives, because that was important. So we had to make sure that we have um, the PPE uh, equipment, we had to have sanitizers, we had to uh, make sure we prepare the, the hospitals to, uh, we had to make sure that uh, we buy the essential commodities that were there, we look after the vulnerable people. All this required money to make sure that at least lives were saved. Then we looked at the businesses which had been severely affected, especially the small and medium enterprises. Most of them don't have a lot of savings on the side. And when there was a lockdown in March 2020, most of them uh, used their savings for survival and then also their capital. So there was a need that you can't uh, let the whole uh, economy collapse. There had to be some stimulus package uh, uh, to allow the economy to proceed. So what happened on that side, of course we borrowed money we are, uh, to, uh, to put in a Uganda Development Bank. So we extended 453 billion uh, shillings to Uganda Development Bank through borrowed money so that they can lend to agriculture, manufacturing, agro-industrialization, and other private sector, because everybody was uh, still crying for good money. Then we also had money, 100 billion, which went eventually went to 260 billion to, for EMIOGA. Those are the talent groups, because we thought these we are targeting those uh, uh, small enterprises to be, to be able to survive. We put 100 billion shillings into Uganda Development Corporation. Why was this? Because we wanted Uganda Development Corporation to do a public-private partnership with some of the companies which were struggling, but they had potential. So we'd inject this money in, and they continue with their productive activities. 
We also had money for the Youth Livelihood Fund, the Women Fund, uh, to try also and target uh, these people on how they could resume their small businesses, to try and make sure that at least self, uh, our lives uh, recover and also livelihoods uh, recover. Um, then on the, we also put some money in uh, Bank of Uganda because when this disruption came, we are no longer exporting the inflows, we are not coming in, and we thought this could cause a disruption on our balance of payments. We wouldn't have the money to pay. Uh, our exchange rate will deteriorate, so there was some money that was lent through, uh, by, uh, to government of Uganda through Bank of Uganda to try and uh, manage um, monetary policy. So, and then other measures that were taken on the tax side, of course, uh, we had an exemption of VAT for hotels and hotel accommodation to try and help them. We have had an, uh, an exemption on all essential equipment to fight uh, against COVID-19. Everything was exempted. Uh, we also uh, deferred taxes. Uh, deferring is not an exemption, but at least you are allowed to retain the money and that improves your cash flow. For payers you earn, for those people who are still employing, we allowed them to retain payers you earn for up to six months. And then they would pay afterwards to help their cash flow. Equally, we allowed uh, some firms to retain their VAT to help them with their cash flow. Then we exempted all interests and penalties that had accrued up to 30th of June, 20. 20. And this was a very sizable amount, about uh, more than 2.5 trillion. So this was to help uh, businesses uh, to recover so that they don't have all these uh, uh, liabilities on their heads. We allowed Bank of Uganda, sorry, to do a restructuring of uh, loans it had with the uh, 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 the loans that were in the financial sector so that they do not become non-performing. So they have been restructured up to end of uh, September to, <coughs> to facilitate, because when your loan becomes non-performing, the banks uh, foreclose and they sell your property. So that was um, alleviated during this time. I think I'll stop here. I saw Patrick standing up. I've talked too much. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Thank you so much, Mr. Kagwa. Uh, just maybe a very quick one. In terms of your projection that, for example, you are a, how much were you expecting to collect and how much did you get? Because it looks like uh, it was 21 trillion, but you got 19 point something, right? Yes. And I'm wondering, how did you even reach 19 a trillion, a shortfall of two point something, yet almost more than half of the country was not working? Ah. What miracle happened? Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> two, uh, t I, I don't know, two, three things happened. One is that uh, there are some sectors, though we are closed, remained operational. Uh, the telecom sector, for example, a lot of people uh, started going digital. So they were using a lot of data and paying tax on that. They were using calls and paying tax on that. They were using mobile money because there's a tax on mobile money and paying tax on that. So we saw at least good revenues coming out of that. And then surprising also, like you said, but it was true, the construction industry remained alive. And um, we've seen that the revenues from there, both uh, on the inputs and then on the profits uh, were tremendous. And I, I would also say this is a time URIA, because there had been changes in URIA, where administration started focusing on taxpayers, for focusing on leakages, closing this leakage and the other. So that's a combination of those factors. Thank you. And there was an up in the uptake in, in, the, in the beverages sector, well, even though the bars and other things are closed. Of course, yes. Then the, there was the, the, these initiatives that were taken 
like uh, digital tax stamps, where, where, where we thought that there is no product that is going to go out of the market, the beverages, without the stamps. And that one can also explain uh, some of the spike. So I suppose uh, the lessons have been picked uh, in, in this era, so maybe our uh, ratio, uh, tax ratio GDP can increase. Yes, it can increase. Uh, first of all, we have the domestic, uh, uh, domestic revenue mobilization strategy, which says that each year we are supposed to increase tax to GDP ratio by a minimum of 0.5%. But you are so, stuck at 13%. No, when you start, like last, uh, last year, I think we moved to, when you look at 19, 18, 19, and 1920, yes, there was a, a, a move uh, in the right, no, 19, 20, 20, 1920 and 2021, there's been a, a sizable increase, a list of about 1%. 2020 and 2021, yeah, maybe. They, okay. they, <laughs> The revenues on a year-to-year okay. -year basis have grown by 14.1%. All right, thank you so much, sir. Um, uh, Maria, you're next. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, the complexities of funding um, for, for social protection, but also looking at national debt and um, and domestic resource mobilization is really hinged a lot to both domestic complexities but also global politics. When we talk about national debt and what it means for financing, um, at not just Uganda but all countries with a sizable amount of debt, especially in the global south, one, we already borrow at very high interest rates and then on top of that we are poor. So when you're when it comes to financing, that is supposed to create the necessary change. You've got to create the balance. So you end up with taking austerity measures against the things that are important for human development and having to pay back debt. I think Zambia was the first country to default um, on their debt in this season. And what that means for the future of Zambia is yet to be seen. But that not said, I think um, I like the great innovations that happened during that time. And for me, it's to think also a little bit more about doing doing work differently. If we think about Uganda as a country, that we, we don't have a lot of money. Of course, that's difficult a lot of times to believe because then there is always a scandal that follows a scandal. And then you can, you, you, you're having a big debate of whether do we actually not have money? or And also because when you think about the threshold of money is looked into, uh, by the Auditor General, a lot of money gets lost below that particular threshold. But that aside, uh, I think it's for us to try innovative and more interesting ways to collect uh, information that can allow for domestic resourcing, but also rethinking the way we finance these sectors. Some of this is also to decolonize the way we think about social protection, the way we think about budgeting, the way we think about tax collection, and the way we think about what qualifies as tax and what doesn't qualify as tax. So one of the most important things that's going to be um, very that's going to be a game changer for how resources are mobilized, but also how we finance anything is data collection. One of that, it's it's unfortunate that Uganda Revenue Authority has high is expected to collect a lot of money, but we don't have a clear database on who is supposed to pay tax, what kind of tax is supposed to be paid. Even the fact that some of us don't know that we are supposed to pay taxes on certain things, let alone the fact that we don't trust the system, so we are also a bit hesitant to pay taxes, and that's also in terms of domestic resource mobilization, that's something we are going to have to think about as a people, that does that state have the legitimacy to encourage its citizens to be able to pay taxes? If in the middle of a pandemic, after all the years that I pay taxes, I cannot get an oxygen cylinder. My instinct is not to want to pay taxes, but it's compulsory. There's nothing I can do about it. If in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we're trying to get vaccines and a member of parliament who does allocation is more interested in 200 million shillings for a car, what do you expect me, Omuntu, okay, I don't qualify as Omuntu, but the, like the other citizens to whether be encouraged in to pay taxes or not. I think also for issues of uh, national debt that, 
what are we borrowing for? I think that's one of the most surprising things. I remember when a loan came to the floor of parliament to borrow for reforestation while they were trying to cut down Bogoma forest to plant sugarcane. It, it defeats the entire purpose of everything that you come and tell us that you're doing to improve the lives of citizens. So I think in moving forward, government has got to, one, build its legitimacy. I don't know how that is going to happen, um, but also we've got to have an honest conversation about debt, what it works for, our capacity to take up these monies, but also to mobilize at a regional level to question the debt that is put upon our countries that don't have the power to even protest a lot of things. because. Uganda might have a problem, but if, if, if IMF's rates are as high as they get, all African countries, all countries in the global south, a lot of middle and low income countries are going to struggle in this process. So for me, my greatest advocacy for financing social protection at an international level is to demand for debt cancellation. There's nothing about that, but also to restructure the, 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 the lending systems. We are like, African countries borrow from loan sharks who just sit in more polished offices and wear suits and have gone to schools, right, to higher schools. So it's important for us to think about it along that way. And finally, if we don't rethink our framework, the reason why we, we struggle with financing but also non-performing loans, uh, not being able to provide the necessary services to people is because we don't like people. Like that's just uh, we can we can paint it in in all sorts of lingo and analysis and data. But if you actually liked the citizens of Uganda, if you thought about them deeply, if they were the beginning point of thinking structures, and if we're thinking about the 82-year-old person in Amudat who is unable to walk to a health center. Uh, that's 10 kilometers away from their facility. That would rethink the way we use our money, but that would also rethink the way we, we collect money and every other thing around financing, but also just generally public resource management to deliver better social protection outcomes. Thank you. Maria, thank you so much. Yes, there was a time when there was a debt cancellation uh, not, f not long ago, but the way how we picked up a huge debt once again uh, at a supersonic speed. So I wonder if we can cancel it and then after two, three years, we again accumulate a bigger debt. So we need to find a way how we are using uh, resources in, in a frugal manner. Okay, Alana. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned the debt cancellation that happened earlier. That was my first introduction. I was young, we were in primary school, and they told us to come. We had to wear T-shirts and march. Uganda was in debt. Of course, I was terrified, because if you're in debt, they are coming. They're either going to arrest you, take everything. But you know, as you grow older, you're, you're, you're told things are OK. And we benefited from that debt. When we canceled that debt, that's how we got the money for universal primary education. So we see an impact, a direct impact between debt and these economic social rights like health and education. But over the years, there's been concerns about the debt, and the little girl in me has been told things are OK. Are they OK? In five years, our debt, this is until 2019, rose from 27% of GDP to 40%. Then COVID happened. And now, in COVID, in, in, when COVID happened, our debt increased by 21.7%. Then just last year, from June till April this year, it rose by 15.1%, right? About 66, 103.2 billion. And um, when we get to what does this mean practically for us, we know that it is going to go over 54% of GDP. We know that they are going to be very, very a lot or is going to go into debt payment. We don't have to look too far. In 2019, our debt servicing bill was the second highest item on the budget. It was above health. And um, the World Bank does say that we are going to be spending about 55 to 60% um, on, e or, 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 on or the ratio of debt service to tax. The ministry is saying about 30%. And these are many figures that are being thrown around. But half of this money is going to go to interest payments. We are going to spend about, in 2019 actually, interest payments on this debt took out 2% of our GDP. That is how much we are spending on, on debt, the servicing of the debt, and the question, <laughs> the question is, do we, do we, do we, who benefits from this debt? Let us look at COVID. We said our debt had to go up because of COVID. 
So we have these IFIs, World Bank, could, Africa could Development you maybe clarify, Bank. Could you maybe clarify, what does yes. it really mean when we say interest payment, debt uh -huh. servicing? Are we actually paying back the money or what? Because we need to know. You know when you have a debt, at some point you have to start paying. But sometimes you can find the amount you're paying is basically interest. You ask me, I have a lot of notes from, from law school, from another country, and more reason to invest in education. But yeah, that, that is essentially what it is, right? That you would think that as you're paying, you can think you're paying, and I'm, I'm clearing, eh? I'm moving, uh, you know? I'm taking against a principle, but now imagine if 2% of your GDP is going on interest payments. Okay, I think that but, the um, situation is dire then. Yeah, but, I, I, uh, and they will, Mr. you know, Mr. Kogo, uh, and he's going to could, could you pause we'll a little bit? It will be, it'll be very good. Alana, good. Alana, could you pause a little bit? Just to clarify, okay. yes. the, we've never paid 2% of GDP in interest, please. I have. Because the, the, shall, the, the shall highest is like 5 trillion, and that's not 2%, okay? So it is more. It is how, okay, how much of GDP have we paid, according to you? It's okay. less. I don't know. <laughs> let us right. have percentage. Let me calculate it. I'll give it to you. Okay. okay. <laughs> but but I think we can both agree that uh, that quite a significant amount of money does go um, in interest payments. But even beyond interest payments, that the impact of our debt on people's ability to get social services, particularly in the future, is something we should all be very concerned about. If we continue with this trajectory, we're mortgaging our future. Now, I'm not going to entirely blame government. I think we need to rethink the entire national financial architecture. And as Maria put out the ways in which as low-income countries, we're left with very little options. You can think about what happened during COVID with special drawing rights, which are these, it's, you can either use, it's, a, car, you can, it's a, a reserve. You can basically get it and keep it as a reserve to strengthen your, your, your position domestically, or you can exchange it and get some money and finance your initiatives. Until this year, until later on this year, countries like Uganda were not benefiting from that. The countries that had the most money were benefiting. Now they finally have given us some special drawing rights. But even then, us, the low-income countries, are getting the least portion of the pie, yet we need it the most. Now the question will ha well, that will come to Ministry of Finance is now that you've, we've gotten these special drawing rights, that are about 346 million US dollars that we can do with, I actually think they will have very few, con they don't have conditions, it's condition free for the most part. They can decide to use it to safeguard the reserves or actually exchange it and put it back and hopefully our call for them has been to put it into social services where Ugandans can actually see. But let's get back to what I was saying before, which was on let's look at just one year. The money we got from the World Bank and IMF Initially, that initial support when COVID had hit, how much of it actually trickled down to the things that many Ugandans spend on health and education, and we can also get into social protection. If you look at the IMF Rapid Credit Facility, most of the money went to the reserves, which you will say, okay, yes, but actually our position, well, as, as some of us, like Isa, argue our position wasn't, did not necessitate a lot of that money going to the reserves. But the other bit of the money of that special, of that credit facility, rapid credit facility, was supposed to go to some way to cushion. That is where we know about money going to Uganda Development Bank. But who benefited? When things were brought, they said Uganda Development Bank decided to implement its strategic plan. We are in a pandemic. This is money to cushion. You're not implementing strategic plans. That one there was already a planned thing. This is a pandemic. And, and, and you can go as well, look at the World Bank. Why was the World Bank giving us a portfolio that was mostly loans compared to grants, yet you're saying you're trying to help us? But even when you do, how much of it goes to strengthening our public health system? And when it does, is the money used as it should? Don't, do, why didn't we see the evidence in June and July when we heard about new machines being broken down, when we heard about people lacking oxygen? Why didn't we see the evidence of that money? And then all these international financial institutions sat together and they said, we want some conditions to make sure this money is used. One of the things they said was publish beneficial ownership. In other words, for these large procurement contracts, you go all the way back so you know eh, who is really the person there. That we either did we ran up and down. That was not done until like later. In fact, I, think, I don't even think it's fully done. And I remember in a bilateral engagement with one of the funders in May, they told us that the form to capture the beneficial ownership had not been done. Uganda, are we serious about transparency? 
are our members of parliament able to actually, you know, look, and, and the Ministry of Finance, to its credit, has a lot of documents it puts out. Do they actually, those are the ones who are there legislating on our behalf, approving on our behalf, do they look at these documents? Do they read, do they ask questions? What involvement does the ordinary Ugandan have with issues like this? Yet, at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to have to pay back the loans. They are going to be squeezed by taxes. And then let's talk about domestic revenue because he talked about it. Because we're in a time of COVID, we know that there's going to be shrinking most of our budgets. Like health, you find a lot of it was external support. Those days are coming to an end. We better get serious about self-reliance. There's going to be a shrinking. So we need to look very seriously at the revenue mobilization. But when you have a country which continuously has done very little to curb illicit financial flows, can we say we are then very serious about domestic revenue mobilization? We get very serious when we are passing taxes that are regressive, that are impacting the ordinary person. That's when we see taxes. In fact, every time I hear a new financial, I say, oh my God, what taxes are we going to get this time? Yet there are loopholes that need to be closed to make sure that money that is leaving this country illicitly, is, whether it's through crime, whether it's through corruption, whether it's through, that, that money is actually, that those loopholes are closed. And I'm yet to see strong commitment on that. Our call to government has always been public services, health, education, water, electricity, these are basics. If a government cannot deliver that, it has no legitimacy, and I'll repeat it. If a government cannot deliver this for its people, it has no legitimacy. It has no legitimacy to ask for tax. It has no legitimacy to take out loans in our name. It has no legitimacy to speak for us. We have to remember the people we are working for. I don't expect the ordinary Ugandan to always be tracking, you know, we've lost two trillion in finance, we've done this. No, 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 there are lots of us who are allies. I need you to be tracking this. But can we also make an effort right from government and these donors, when they come with these loans, can you involve and engage citizens? When you go down to monitor, can you engage the citizens so you can see that there is value for money? At the end of the day, Ugandans are going to pay back these loans. And right now, public trust is at an all-time low. You remember what happened in June and July. People are failing, are having to buy oxygen, deposit land titles to get health care. They're also being told our debt is here. I remember a media house that even divided how much each of us would pay. People began saying, ah, do you want us to get to what happened in Kenya? When Kenya, when the IMF was approving another loan, they like proper lost it. They say this is now a cartel. And now Uganda has a one billion loan by the IMF, right? It's supposed to go to budget support. Will we actually see our health and education finance? I, I know you have stood just la one last minute. The times of saying that we shall get to health and education, those of us who are also in the legal field, you always hear progressive realization, we shall get to them, we have no money. Those days are over. If you do not prioritize health and education, your economy is going to suffer. There is no one who is going to be there to pay back this debt. Alana there, a round of applause to Alana. Sometimes Alana can be so passionate about these issues, and uh, I, she, they are, I think they are so close to her heart. And I, I'm thinking, if we have so many Alanas in this town, <laughs> things could be very different. I mean, imagine, they are heavily borrowing in our name. But are they investing for us? All right, let's, let's move on. Uh, the Executive Director, Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group, CSBAG, is Mr. Julius Mukunda. You're next, sir. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, good evening. I think it's a good evening, uh, listeners. And the viewers, the listeners, and wherever you are, I, I, I think Patrick, for me, is um, having interacted with these issues for, for quite some time, I've come to one conclusion that it is upon us citizens to take charge in terms of how government is utilizing these resources. But, but before that, let me tell you one thing is that there is no free lunch. There is no free, as pure and clear as that, that we, we are getting loans, grants, there is no free lunch. Whatever we are getting, we will pay for it, whether in cash or in kind. 
and all these concessions we hear about the IPOs, the agreements, that's how we are paying back. So it, it's very important that as we get these, ma these, 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 these amounts of money coming in, we need to understand how we are going to pay back. That's number one. Number two is, I don't think in terms of raising money for, for, for this country, U Uganda, that borrowing is bad. It's not bad. Every successful company you see in this country, don't even go very far, it must have a debt portfolio in it. There is a loan somewhere, it borrowed money somewhere. But also we know countries that have gone down, have gone down because of loans. So it's not about borrowing, it's what you are borrowing for. And I think that's what we need to interrogate. And, and, and what we are borrowing for matters a lot. So if you borrow money to construct markets around major highways, and the people who are supposed to use these markets actually don't want to use them. They say, no, that is for government. They want to still stay in the other corner. Just go to Rukaya, there's that new nice, nice market done, and, and the guys are still on the side, stay, stay selling their meat. And, and I think that structure has been there for almost a year now or two, and w again, we can, we can, we can uh, uh, blame COVID, but the guys are still on the other side. So it, it, it is how we are using the money, whether it is ours internally that we are generating, or we are getting it from abroad or anywhere. Whether it is concessional or it's not, how we are using that particular money. And that's when I say that as Ugandan, I think we have given too much powers to government. Why is it that when World Bank gives us money for our primary school, it is built, but we cannot ask why the school is not functioning? I cannot expect Mr. Kagwa to come to my village in a way to see how Kawagoma primary school is functioning. It's impossible. I expect the people around, the, teacher, the, 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 the parents around, to be able to see how that school is, is functioning and, 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 and raise an alarm. But I think we have gone into a state of apathy and we have said, ah, ah, we are government, don't touch. We are being threatened, you know, we are being beaten, so we are in that state of mode. And I think it's high time we get out and, and, and begin to push back in terms of, this is my primary school, this is my health center, I want to see how it is functioning. And there are very good examples of those that have been done by different organizations where communities have organized and mobilized demand for better service delivery. The, we need to start from that. The second important element, I think, in terms of raising money, I, I think uh, one key area that has successfully worked, and I have always urged, is that in this country we don't need new tax, taxes, neither do we need new tax rates. But we need to make sure each and every person pays their share, fair share of taxes. I know of a scenario when the digital stamps came, a company that was paying 50 million in VAT returns was now paying 180. Not only one company, but so many of those companies. Why? Because the system of collecting was extreme, had so many leakages. So imagine if all of us would pay our fair share of taxes. Let me tell you, the rate would even reduce. And I would encourage, for me, I would support that. Let's ensure we support those institutions to ensure that everybody pays. I cannot pay tax on the street A I'm paying property tax. The next property is not paying, or is paying half. We're on the same street for heaven's sake. Why should it be like that? You go on these investors we talk about, you go on a company's payroll, an MOD is paid the same salary as a janitor. And you ask, and he's an expert who came, you, you really begin to wonder how this is happening. And, and I think that's where the problem is when you talk about leakages. That's the reality of how people have invested in evading taxes. So let us fix the system. I can tell you the rates would go low, rather than bringing these unpopular taxes. I can tell you it's unpopular. When you bring mobile money tax, everybody's up in arms. Already paying tax is a headache. But 
when you begin to bring the unpopular ones, now you make it even more worse. So I think on the part of government, that's something that we could be able to look at. So with all this, where should we be spending money? I, and I think this is very important. We know COVID came. We've talked about COVID. If it is anywhere, we have really exhausted the effects of COVID. But what should we do as a country like Uganda? I think for me, first and foremost, is supporting public systems that deliver services. What do I mean? She talked about the public health system. COVID has equalized everybody. Nobody ever talked about uh, the, the cost of oxygen. But when COVID came, the cost of oxygen became an issue. Let me tell you why. Because it was the middle class and the upper class that where that they, they felt they could manage the expenses that are there. But these things have been there. Ordinary people are dying because they lack oxygen in a covered hospital, in a good hospital, whatever it is. It's now time to say, because of these situations, let each and every hospital ensure that they have the minimum basics. I think that's very important because when a situation like this happens, nobody's going to fly out. We are all here. We are going to depend on what we have. And I think the keynote address was very clear. Even important presidents and prime ministers, when COVID hit them, they relied on their public health systems. So we need to invest in that. And to do that, we also need to be very f serious and keen on where we are spending this money. The parliamentary report on how COVID was managed is so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad story when you listen to it. Because you find that you are spending more on enforcing guidelines than supporting people to adhere to the guidelines. Instead of, you know, of ensuring that actually you support buying of, you know, of, of, of masks, in, in supporting distribution of food, you no, know, you have to support the security, you have to ensure that uh, people go out and monitor, and yet you know it becomes a bit of a challenge. If people are hungry or are sick, it becomes difficult for them to abide the guideline. That's, that's number one. Number two, I think in these times when we, the, the little money that we get is we need to spend the little money on supporting livelihoods. And, and for me, livelihoods is, I'm not meaning that we should support the private sector, the big boys and girls. I mean, we need to look at issues of doing agriculture. That's our best. I have told the people, Japan will be very good at making cars, robots, but they can never beat us if we are serious in growing beans. No, and they will need the beans from us. So if we have that advantage, let us invest in it. It will not only help the Japanese for in terms of export, but even us in terms of food security. The, the last thing for me, Patrick, I think what we need to do is to get serious on corruption. Again, the parliamentary report on COVID management is a story, is a story in its own. But let me tell you, corruption, corruption has also, is also has gone into another mode. People no longer go to the system and, 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 and redirect the money to another beneficiary, no. Corruption in this country now is, you plan for it. Yeah. Yeah. You plan for it, you put it in the, you, you, you take it to parliament, then it is appropriated, and then you execute it. It's, it's, it, it that's how it is. Yeah. So you get this pen, put it in the budget, and say the pen is going to cost, I mean, this pen could probably be costing something like, you know, 3,000 Ugandan shillings. And they will say, no, it is 20,000 Ugandan shillings. It goes through the whole process of appropriation and it is done, Patrick. So that's a pain. So imagine a road, imagine a factory, imagine a classroom, not one but a thousand classroom blocks. That's how we are losing money. Six to seven percent of the entire budget is on procurement. So if we are to deal with that, I can tell you can save enough resources to deal with the small issues that we are talking about as a country. Just one thing to do, put a, a national price list. For example, that Uganda government pennies will cost 500 shillings. Whether you want to supply or not, it is 500. Let me tell you, you will save it all. I thank you. You know, there are times when Julius makes a presentation and they get holy anger. <laughs> and I ask myself, why? 
you know, why? How, how, how did we get here? Okay, this is the moment when we get to hear views from the you, you who are here and those who are following us on, on social media. And um, I'm going to be taking your questions or your comments uh, one by one, but also allow me also to bring in the comments that have, have come from uh, those who are following us on, uh, on social media, because it's important for us to involve them, they get to know. But yes, sir, we could go first as I look for them. Thank you very much, Patrick, and thank you, the panelists. Uh, my name is Najib Kasule, and I'm a member of NETPIL. Uh, my question goes to the commissioner, M Moses Kagwa. Oh, sorry. <laughs> how, how are we doing with taxing the high net individuals in Uganda? There's really been research done in the recent years that these people are not really taxed, and they, they don't pay their fair share of taxes. Actually, the, the research noted that there is a small unit in URA charged with monitoring these individuals, and they were about six in number. And when something they call political pressure came, the unit was transferred in some other unit inside URA. And why aren't we, uh, why don't we have accountability and, and transparency in people who pay taxes? We see it in other jurisdictions in, in America where people were, were, were questioning the tax returns of, of the president. Why don't we have a policy in Uganda? Why do we have secrecy in, in, in people's money, people who pay money? Why doesn't it be open out there to see who pays taxes and who doesn't pay taxes? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kaga will respond to that. Uh, let me get more. Perhaps he has two or three more questions so that he can answer at once. Yes, ma'am. Please take it. Thank you. Um, good evening. Thank you very much. I don't have a question for you, Mr. Kagwa. Uh, my name is Fiona Komsana. I work with Akina Mama Africa, and I just wanted to make a few comments uh, in response to some of the things that have been said. One, to agree with Maria that the government of Uganda hates us, and that is the only way you can justify mm, cutting a health budget in the middle of a pandemic, which is what happened in the last, in this financial year. And then to say that we cannot advocate our way out of bad governance. We can have all, as many conversations as we, we want, but the fact that there is a, a systemic issue that is rooted within our government uh, means that our solution then lies in uh, being able to mobilize citizens to demand and uh, I know that Kenya is a good example of how that has been happening, but we don't know if that is going to translate into actually their governments not taking on loans. But I think it's important to put our governments on notice. Um, and that the idea that somehow government is not equipped to provide public services, which is why there's always a conversation around giving money to private players to be able to provide these services really needs to be uh, one of those things that we push back against. And finally, uh, again, to the point of we cannot advocate our way out of bad governance, to say that there has always been a crackdown on civil society actors and civil society um, civil society organizations right now, we've seen that a number of them have been closed, a number of them have been prosecuted. So it's important to think about safeguarding um, in terms of doing this work, because again, the government of Uganda hates us. So no, you're you. saying we cannot advocate our way out, but of what can we do? Governance. Yes, I was saying that we have to mobilize our citizens to be able to demand, because the, the space that within which we are doing this right now, which is within the civil society organizations, is an echo chamber, and there is also a crackdown on that. So we, meet, we need to take the conversation to the people, which right. I think is, this is a great space to do that, to start doing that. Thank, thank you, you. Mr. Musana there, thank you so much. Komsana. Uh, Komsana, thank you so much. And uh, somebody has, has at uh, on, on, uh, sent it on social media is saying one GB for 5,000 is a lot of money. I request our leaders to reduce internet charges, and most especially now that everything is done on the internet, our children need to access the internet and be able to learn from it. Please reduce internet charges. We parents are suffering. Our children left out as far as studying is concerned. And uh, there's somebody who says, power has gone, so I'm no longer on TV. Nyanyu. <laughs> Ochokoro. Ochokoro, have you heard that? <laughs> Uh, somebody says, Secretary to LOC1, 
I can't thank you enough for bringing out critical issues regarding financial constraints at lower local governments where service, services are supposed to be easily accessed and utilized. And um, somebody says, uh, Nakas Nakasaga Rosemary says, Honorable Rashida, government has to do its role and citizens need to be sensitized and be empowered to be able to demand for their services. And uh, Margaret Happy, you say budgeting and planning processes ideally is supposed to be bottom top approach, but the reverse is true due to heavily depending on central government transfers to local governments. I thank you, those who are watching and sending in your comments. It appears it shows that you are following this discussion keenly. Okay, yes, sir. No, but you had, all right, I, you had an opportunity before, so uh, I think let's take to somebody who has not talked yet, and then... Oh, sorry, I'll just be quite brief. Okay. Uh, the commissioner talked about uh, Uganda Development Corporation working in tandem with uh, some private actors to form PPPs. My question is, before you actually agree to go into partnership with some of these companies, do you actually vet them in terms of their tax compliance? because that is very critical. Because, because before you give the money to some of these manufacturers, how tax compliant are they? Then finally, can you also think about stopping the gaps in terms of the loopholes as provided by the tax law? Because that is the basis upon which we are suffering. Thank All you. All right, thank you. We're not doing so well on time now. Um, we have a hand here and then in the front row. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Faith Lumonia from Akina Mama Africa. I just have a question uh, for Mr. Kagwa. I'm curious to know why uh, this financial year, the budget to the health sector was reduced. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, there's a, a gentleman here and then the panelists will respond. We conclude with Mr. Moses Kagwa. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Mine is just a historic analysis and ask whether we can borrow from what the keynote speaker talked about. The issue of uh, the, the political and ideological framework. My history tells me 1969 to 71, Uganda was in the surplus, meaning we had more than we really needed. We could use it within a certain are we on the right track when uh, the executive director Sussberg, says borrowing is good? How come borrowing was kept minimally in 1969-71 and we're flourishing? Are we on the right track by uh, focusing on borrowing, yet we know borrowing endangers even a family or a nation? It's just a question. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Is there anybody who has uh, a question? Yes, we have a, a gentleman on, on here. Thank you, Mr. Kagwa. He was my lecturer, then uh, later we worked together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why you were away <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> we recalled that it took about a month for government to come up with a list of vulnerable people to share a small amount of money. <laughs> and it has even now imagined that even the list they came up with was fake. <laughs> the Ugandans just cheated you and you, you were paying millionaires uh, the 100,000 shillings as support during this second uh, lockdown. How can a country which has had a government which has been stable for now 35 years, we have not had, a, uh, you know, how can you not have a list of vulnerable people in a country which oh, is not at war? Okay, you, all right. Thank you so much, and uh, let's take a pause there because for those who are, are following us on NTV Uganda on our social media platforms, we want to say kwaheri for you, but for those of us who are here in the auditorium, we're going to continue with the discussion and conclude it uh, for NTV viewers around Uganda. Thank you, and kwaheri.